Mallet. It's kept Mallet. in email. You can see. We got some of my thoughts for this family. Need that again. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the city council meeting of the city of Northampton. It is November 21st, 2019. I'm Ryan O'Donnell, and I'll be presiding tonight. And these proceedings, for information, are being audio and video recorded. We will start with public comment. I have a sign-up sheet, which I will go down, and then. Anyone who has not signed up is also more than welcome to speak on any topic. We ask everyone to have equal time um, in the amount of three minutes. So the first person is Jeannie Mulvey. Ms. Mulvey, if you come up and the floor is all yours. Um, I'm on Bridge Street and I have my store with Georgini and it's a block where there's been 10 hour parking and we're hoping tonight that it'll be changed back to two hour parking but you guys will vote for that because it really affects business. And I'm hoping it would be done before Black Friday. <laughs> so, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, John Skibitsky. I'm a resident of Northampton all my life. And uh, uh, I know a little bit about Northampton, but at the present time, I want to read a statement here. Uh, keep me on schedule here. I'd like to bring to your attention and make you aware of the discovery of rare prehistoric artifacts found at the intersection of North King Street and Hatfield Streets in Northampton, and to recommend an active effort by the city to preserve the site for further research the recovered artifacts were termed rare and predate Native American culture as we know it. Such sites are really rare and needed for further research of early ancient peoples who were living in Northampton some 9,000 years ago. That's a short time after the Ice Age. They were here. The site is proposed to be paved over by installing a roundabout. Archaeologists, even in Europe, have questioned the destruction of the site here in Northampton. The site can easily be saved by installing a monitored traffic light at the Hatfield Street exit. So presently, the city has the responsibility to either put an effort into saving and preserving its history or otherwise just do nothing and allow bearing our history, which, which presently has high interest from nationally known archeologists, anxious for new sources to gather information about early cultures. So with this, in, for, uh, so with this notification, if documented history means anything, I ask the city to make an effort to save this site from destruction and preserve history, Northampton's history. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skibitsky. <coughs> uh, is uh, Keanu Patwari here? If I, right. I got it right? Yep. Um, so, thank you. First of all, I want to second what you said. Um, off topic. Second of all, um, I am a prospector small business owner in Northampton. Um, I've noticed as I'm searching for a place to open up my business that there are a lot of empty storefronts downtown, and a lot of a lot of small businesses are being deterred from opening up due to the high costs of actually renting, buying, or owning a building downtown. So I was hoping to ask the city council um, to evoke some sort of mandates to help, <coughs> you know, either help small business owners to more easily open up in the downtown area to fill those empty storefronts or to help reduce the prices, or <coughs> I guess the pricing of owning, renting, et cetera, in downtown. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that's the first comment that proves that I've, uh, illustrates that I forgot to say something, which is our practice is we don't engage in a back and forth during this part of the meeting. So it's sometimes the case that people come to the council with thoughtful questions and topics, and then we can't discuss them now. But you should feel encouraged to follow up with me or other members of the city council, and I'd be happy to talk to you about these issues. Okay, so, so thank you for sharing those opinions tonight <coughs> with everybody. <coughs> and now I'll ask uh, Gladys Franco, please. Ms. 
Frank. Hello, well, good evening. First of all, I want to give you kudos because you took the time to educate your resident as to how this works. And not every, not every city council meeting that I've gone to works quite like that. So thank you for taking the time to do Thank that. you very much. My name is Gladys Franco. I'm the clerk of the Migration Advocates Committee for the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice. I'm here to thank you all for your support of the Safe City Ordinance. We have been working on this issue for quite some time, back to 2010 and 2011, when communities found themselves voluntarily assisting the federal government with historically increased scrutiny of undocumented immigrants. I was happy to work to see Springfield take the lead on the issue, and then here in Northampton, with a resolution expressing the desire to not voluntarily collaborate with ICE. That resolution in Northampton was followed up with an executive order, which was among the first in Western Massachusetts, which directs the chief of the police department to take certain steps. Now five years later, we find ourselves in an even more divisive climate. Cities and now entire states have been codifying their desire to not voluntarily do the, the bidding of the Trump administration. This has taken the form of state legislation and in Massachusetts, ordinances and bylaws that establish that municipalities will not expend the resources doing something that is exclusively the role of the federal government. In the age of real encroachment <coughs> of the federal government on the cohesiveness of our communities, people at the grassroots, like, like us, are resisting. The Resistance Center, along with the Immigrant Protection Project, has been working from Springfield to Greenfield, to, from Amherst to East Hampton and a couple more places, to codify civil rights within our communities. It is a time for many reasons for municipalities and states to codify the intention to retain our resources for our own important and pressing needs, <coughs> not for attacking the most vulnerable among us. After this ordinance received a unanimous favorable vote in the last Legislative Matters meeting, Northampton is poised to join the cities and towns as well as entire states that have enshrined their commitment to their own residents, to their own community. If there is a time when it is important to make the right choice in history, it is now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Elise Gitman, please. Hello. My name is Elise Gitman. I'm a student at Smith and an intern at the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice. I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Javier Luengo Guerrero from the ACLU's Immigrant Protection Project, who is currently doing work at the Arizona border. Javier writes, I write this as the ACLU of Massachusetts Immigrant Protection Project coordinator as a first-generation immigrant and as somebody who works every day with our immigrant community all across Western Massachusetts. First of all, as an ACLU of Massachusetts staff member, I want to say that this ordinance is constitutional, just, and right. In conjunction with our partners at the Resistance Center, we have made sure that this ordinance doesn't violate state and federal law. This piece of legislation in front of you will be one of the most important pieces of legislation that a city council can pass this year, a year when our immigrant community has been attacked, separated, and criminalized. Voting in favor of this ordinance puts you as part of the resistance to the Trump administration war against minorities. The ACLU of Massachusetts Immigrant Protection Project fights every day against family separation here in Northampton and at, at the US-Mexico border. As a first generation immigrant, I stand with my people, with those families who are being targeted by our state and federal government. I talk and work every day with them, and I can tell you with certainty, this is what is needed to make immigrants who are an essential part of our community feel safer and trust their own local government. That no city resources should be allocated to cooperate with ICE in any manner, including no use of city resources to inquire about immigration status is the most basic provision that a municipality can take to protect their own residents and create trust among the immigrant community. Thank you to the city council for voting in favor of the safe city ordinance. Thanks to Mayor Narkowitz for his leadership protecting and supporting the integration of our immigrant neighbors. Thank you to Jeff Napolitano and the Resistance Center for leading the fight and for taking these policies across the Commonwealth to protect our immigrant community. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone else who has not signed up 
like to speak on any subject? We're not a particularly shy city. Usually people jump right up, so. Uh, but hearing no other public comment, we will start <coughs> meeting, and I will ask for a roll of the council, please. Councillor Bidwell. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Klein. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. And Councillor Shara. Here. They're all here. Um, the first thing I'll do is announce a public hearing. The following public hearing is hereby advertised. Um, well, we're also advertising it, but I'm announcing it tonight. In accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Mass uh, uh, Northampton Massachusetts, Article 6, Administrative Organization, Section 6.1, Organization of City Agencies. Uh, by order of the City Council, the Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, December 5th, 2019, at 7.05 here in the Council Chambers. Um, the Wallace J. Puchowski Municipal Building, 212 Main Street, Northampton, <coughs> Mass. The City Council will consider the proposed amendments to the City of Northampton Administrative Code. Uh, part one, administrative organization, um, which includes one, uh, 201, Office of the Mayor, 207, Office of Planning and Sustainability, 403, Senior Services, and 601, Department of Public Works. Part two, multiple member appointive organization. Uh, it's uh, 109, multiple member body internal organization. Uh, 5.0, assessors, board of. 11.0, Energy and Sustainability Commission, 14.0, uh, Housing Partnership, and 24.0, Transportation and Parking Commission. Did I skip anything? I said all that. Uh, the City Council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. The City Council meeting, of course, starts at 7 p.m., but we usually start the hearing, we would start it right now after public comment. So that is on December 5th. And if you want to look at copies of the Mayor's proposed changes to the administrative code. Um, I'm sure his office can provide copies. Uh, the City Council, it's actually on our agenda this evening. If you want to look it up that way as well. Are there any updates from members of the City Council? Councilor Dwight. Uh, <coughs> the Charter Review Committee is wrapping things up and actually voted to approve the final report that will be presented formally um, to this body on December 5th here in these chambers. Um, and there have been no uh, modification, there were no modifications. It's actually a rel relatively short and poignant meeting as everyone acknowledged the good slide. So you'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, the Chair Stan Moulton and Vice Chair Sam Hopper. Um, and other committee members will be present for questions if you have, if, if the council should have any, or anyone from the public should have any questions. So. Thank you very much. Thank you for you representing the city council on that pretty important committee to it was overhaul our charter. So. Really, it was an honor, so thank you. Uh, any other announcements from members of the <coughs> Hearing none, um, Mr. Mayor, do you have any communications this evening? Yes. All right. We have two presentations. We've apparently added an eighth member of the council whose name is Adele Franks. <laughs> because she was presenting two disparate items. Um, Ms. Franks, feel free to come up. Um, but I'll be changing the, my hat. In oh, good. I'm glad you brought a costume. That's good. So the first thing is um, the Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction, also known in a, a fun-loving way as Skipper. <laughs> And uh, this is tonight a presentation and possible discussion of its final report, which was submitted. Um, this was the very first select committee that the city council uh, created uh, pursuant to rule change a few years ago. Select committees are members of the city council, but also citizens. And uh, the sponsors, including Councilor Klein uh, and Councilor Nash, brought forward this proposal to have a committee meet on the issue of pesticide use in our city. And we had some very excellent people uh, do a lot of hard work over, what, five months, six months, something like that? Like four months. On an expedited timetable of four months, but yet I saw the work you did and um, um, you approached the job diligently and did, uh, submitted a great report, which is also available to the public. 
And so first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, you, you were the chair of the committee. I want to thank you and the whole committee for the work that you've done. And with that, I will just shut up and turn it over to you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the results of our efforts. Uh, as you all know, you appointed, uh, you authorized the creation of this select committee. I didn't realize it was the first, but I'm very honored that it was. <laughs> um, and uh, in addition to the two counselors who you named and, and myself, uh, we had the benefit of two other members, uh, Cynthia Swapis, who is uh, a member of the Board of Health and also uh, a professor of health communications at UMass. And we had uh, the excellent expertise of Kate Simmons, who is an environmental chemist and uh, was an invaluable help to round out our five-member committee. I honestly don't know why you all thought we could do all this work on a very complicated topic in such a short amount of time, but we really, we, we worked our butts off um, <coughs> to try to accomplish as much as we possibly could within that time frame. So, uh, what did we do? We, uh, with the help of uh, the mayor, we were able to interview all of the city departments who had any, um, anything to do with the use of pesticides. That was the Office of uh, Planning and Sustainability, Central Services, including staff who oversee the maintenance of the school grounds, the DPW, and the Department of Health. So first of all, I, I want to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what we mean by pesticides. It includes all chemical substances that are created to kill living things that, that, we've, that we don't want around, like, for example, insecticides to kill insects, and fungicides to kill mold, and herbicides to kill weeds and invasive plants, and um, uh, what other important category am I forgetting? But in any case, there's a lot of them, and they're, um, they're all subsumed under the rubric of pesticide, and that's what we're talking about. So why would we want to reduce the use of pesticides in Northampton? Well, <laughs> it's not a very hard question to answer. Uh, pesticides are designed to kill the living things, and they're not very selective. So they may kill the thing you want to kill, but they also have ill effects on other living beings uh, that happen to be in the neighborhood, like humans, um, <coughs> animals, plants, uh, our entire ecosystem. So over the last couple decades, there's been increasing concern about how we're really poisoning ourselves. We're creating a really toxic environment. We're using too many pesticides and other chemicals, and we really need to turn this thing around. And more and more information became known about the ill effects of pesticides to the point that the American Public Health Association has issued several very strong statements about how we need stronger regulation about pesticides. We need to do better at protecting people from pesticides. The American Association of Pediatrics issued very strong statements about the ill effects of pesticides on children and um, including neurodevelopmental problems as well as some um, malignancies. And the American Medical Association, the Endocrine Society, and, and others have jumped on board uh, to reflect on endocrine disrupting chemicals, pesticides being one of the kinds of chemicals that permanently disrupt the endocrine system and have permanent impacts. So getting back to what did we do to look at, well, what is Northampton doing and what <coughs> are the opportunities for Northampton to reduce its use of pesticides? We interviewed those departments and we learned a great deal from them. Uh, it, was, it was a really uh, interesting educational experience to find out more about what each of these departments actually does. We created and we held two public forums, which were very well attended and uh, brought out 27 people who were concerned about the use of pesticides. And we also announced that we were accepting uh, comments by email. So we had about 50 communications altogether uh, from the public, and most of those were concerns about um, pesticide use and the ill effects of pesticide use, and a lot of people said, please ban pesticides, please ban Roundup, please ban glyphosate, et cetera, et cetera. We had a, a handful of people who, uh, who spoke in favor of maintaining the ability to use herbicides to control invasive species of plants that um, 
can, t can take over areas as we, as we know. And we had one farmer who expressed uh, concern uh, that any restriction on pesticide use would violate the, um, the right to farm ordinance that we have here. <clears throat> there was also a uh, person who spoke and submitted written comments and who has in fact submitted a number of uh, written statements to various members of the city about the fact that she lives right next door to a farm that uses um, Roundup and that she's very concerned about her children's health. So we learned a lot from the public about their concerns. We, um, with the help of Kate Simmons, we created a list of products that either have been and are being used by various departments in Northampton or have been listed as might be used. That is, once it's on the integrated pest management list for a school, for example, the school can then use that chemical without any further ado. So uh, there were some pretty long lists and we included all of those in our table with a lot of other very useful information. And I, maybe some people would consider it not very useful because it's pretty technical, but information about the toxicity, various kinds of toxicity of these chemicals, which is also included in an appendix of our report. We looked at other municipalities that had, um, that are doing better than we are have decided that they really want to reduce the use of pesticides and have taken steps in that direction. And we looked at grants and other resources that could provide Northampton with funding and training opportunities uh, in the future should Northampton want to re further reduce its pesticide use. So what we found is that we were very pleased to learn that there are some efforts underway by some departments to reduce the use of pesticides in Northampton. Uh, Office of Planning and Sustainability is, uh, did a pilot with goats to chew up some invasive plants and is hoping to expand that and uh, to uh, uh, use these goats in a, in a more extensive fashion. So we're hoping that that will work out. The uh, DPW, of course, manages the Florence playing fields um, using organic methods and uh, has decided I guess kind of informally, internally, um, over the last three years, that they would stop using pesticides on other municipal playing fields and parks as well. So they most they they, they try to um, manage those organically as well. However, we did learn that there's quite a few pesticides that are in use uh, in Northampton, and that there is no apparently no policy, no ordinance. Um, that opposes the use or in, in endeavors to uh, restrict the use of pesticides in Northampton. What we learned from other municipalities who have um, really uh, made efforts to reduce their use of pesticides is that without a permanent policy change and without ongoing training of not just one staff member but lots of staff members, what happens is that even if they do a pilot and they say, oh yeah, this is working really well, what happens over time is that human beings being what we are, we tend to go back to our old habits and so we just sort of gravitate back to using the pesticides that we're, that we're used to using. And so their strong recommendation was you, you really have to establish a permanent policy or an ordinance and you have to provide ongoing training. Otherwise, you're just going to revert back to um, old habits. And people think, you know, oh, I can buy this stuff at the hardware store. It has to be safe. Well, it's not true. It's the only reason you can sell it in the hardware store in this country is because the lobbying efforts of the chemical industry. Um, and it's th these products are far from safe, and they are um, overused and not used in, this in, a, very, in a safe fashion. So uh, I did make some slides for our recommendations. What we are recommending is that first thing is that you all create another, oh, our, our, our committee, our select committee is, has finished our task, so we no longer <coughs> exist. But somebody needs to carry this torch or else um, nothing's gonna happen. So we would urge you all to uh, create uh, some other new type of committee that would take this on and make sure that um, 
it doesn't just die, die out uh, for lack of attention. We need to keep the momentum going. Second, sec uh, our second um, recommendation is that we explicitly state that we are going to or, uh, manage the cha places that children play on municipal property, such as parks and playing fields, using only organic management. Now, uh, this is an informal policy of the DPW right now, but we would like to see that codified, and um, I believe that there will be an ordinance that you all will be considering in the near future um, that will explicitly require that. The, the third recommendation is to engage the school districts, the Northampton Public Schools and Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School as well, in the same conversation. Now, the uh, city solicitor's interpretation is that um, the city council does not have jurisdiction over the schools, so um, we would, rather than rolling this all together into one, one topic and one ordinance, we would uh, recommend that the school systems be engaged in the same conversation and urged <coughs> to do exactly the same thing. Then fourth, we, uh, we urge the elimination of herbicide use in parking lots and sidewalks because it's not necessary. There's, uh, there's really no justification to put the public at risk. There are pets and toddlers who are walking pretty close to the ground in those areas. <coughs> and then in the, uh, there was a, uh, we missed one. There was a fifth sure how to go uh, back. I'm sorry. recommendation to create a, a, um, an, a, a waiver process so that all city staff know that if they want to use um, a toxic herbicide or a toxic pesticide, that there's a process that they need to go through to get approval to do that. Um, that, makes sh that, that creates a certainty that other efforts will be tried, that um, less toxic substances will be tried first, and, um, and other, other municipalities have done this, uh, so we have to assume that it does not create um, any problems, that in fact um, the, uh, the procedure works in a timely fashion so that emergencies can be addressed in a very timely way. And then seventh, or sixth, we, uh, we recommend that the city undertake an educational campaign so that both not only the city departments, but uh, <coughs> homeowners and businesses also understand um, the toxicity of pesticides and how dangerous they are to use and how there are, in fact, alternatives that are effective and that pesticides are really not, not a necessary evil. And uh, moving right along to seven, uh, we are also encouraging private entities to go organic, and we would like to see the city engage in, with these private entities, such as Smith College, Child's Park, and Look Park, to uh, avoid the use of pesticides, because obviously children and other members of the public are playing on those, uh, on those fields and those parks uh, all the time. We would like to, su to suggest um, an exploration for a transition of city-owned farmland to organic management. Now we know that there is a right to farm ordinance that specifically says farmers um, can use pesticides. Um, but city-owned farmland is a special category of farmland. And especially if it happens to be in a residential neighborhood, the, in the ideal world, we would really like to see resources be provided to farmers who might wish very much to learn how to farm without these toxic substances. So that, uh, uh, we would like to see that, um, that, that as, an, as a conversation that continues uh, f after this report has uh, been digested. And then lastly, we feel, um, also based on what other municipalities have done, that there needs to be a permanent pesticide reduction oversight body. So that there's some body whose job it is to keep this conversation going, that it's not just going to die, um, that in fact this body would ho hopefully consist of members of all the city departments so that they have a stake in the matter. 
uh, that it would be tasked with reviewing progress on a regular basis, solving problems as they arise, documenting when waivers have been applied for and for what reasons, uh, making sure that educational programs are actually being carried out in our city, engaging with the private entities that I, that, that I mentioned uh, where so many members of the public spend time, and also uh, promote the use of grants and free training opportunities that are offered by a number of organizations right here in, within our state. So that is, that is, in a nutshell, our report and our recommendations, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, and not to repeat myself, but I, I really appreciate the seriousness with which you, you went about this work, I, and I appreciate that you consulted with the mayor's office and various departments, um, and, and then all the people you brought in and other communities, it's just, it's just a really tremendous product and, and thoughtful piece of work, thank you, and I, I see many different options that I doubt this city council can get to, but I also see new councilors in the audience, and uh, so maybe some fun ideas, um, if they don't already have their own ideas, which I'm sure they all do as well. Um, so lots to talk about, and uh, I won't monopolize the floor. I'll ask if uh, any members of the council would like to opine or ask any questions on this to start. Can I just make one point of clarification? Yes. Um, just to clarify why we have as recommendations um, a public education campaign, uh, this is for the public that doesn't know this, and talking to private <coughs> entities about um, reducing their pesticide use is because because of state preemption laws around pesticides the City Council does not have the authority to mandate that private entities can't use pesticides um, that is within the purview of the state legislature so that's why we have these recommendations that don't have teeth per se we cannot um, legislate uh, how private entities can or can't use pesticides. So that's why those those recommendations look the way they do. Thanks. Very good point. Uh, any other members of the council? Uh, yes. The will of okay. so Council Barge. I want to thank you and your group. You did an excellent job. And I'm very, very happy to see about hopefully helping farmers who are farming on city farmland and educating them. And I think it's very important for me as a counselor because it is happening in Ward 6 and I need to protect everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Bidwell. Uh, I'd like to also compliment you and your colleagues on the committee. It's a really incredibly thorough job given the time constraints. Um, so very, very nicely done. Uh, I, I too am curious about what you discovered about a possible clash between right to farm law and uh, a desire to limit use of pesticides on city owned land that's that's rented out to a private farmer what what what, what, what have you what have you concluded about if 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 there were a, a city ordinance if we moved in the direction of a city ordinance that that prohibited use of or phased out use of pesticides over a certain period of time on city land uh, how would that fit with, uh, with right to farm law? Well, the, the ordinance that I believe you'll be considering um, only uh, applies to places that children play, right. so that would be parks and playing fields. It, does, it would not apply to farmland. If you wanted it to apply to farmland, you would have to change the right to farm ordinances, I believe. Um, a, less, uh, a less formal way to do that, I think, uh, could be with through discussions with the Agricultural Commission and the specific That's farmers right. involved. Um, and I, I would expect that there might be more interest in that if we were offering something rather than just asking them to change what they're doing. I mean, no, nobody wants to see farmers go out of business, but we would love to see them adopt um, more environmentally friendly farming methods. But if we provided some resources to them in that process, uh, they might be more interested in, in pursuing it. So that, that would be my personal preference. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the council? Councilor Dwight. Um, looking at the table that you guys drafted, and by the way, kudos again 
Um, you're gonna, everyone's going to thank you. Kate's table. Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm also looking at I'm, with the table I'm looking at right now is the municipal oh, pesticide yeah, yeah, policy yeah, summary. So, table. thank you. <laughs> thank you. My teacher, actually. <laughs> um, and I see it back in 2005, Marblehead actually did a comprehensive ban. Uh, but I'm not sure what that meant by a comprehensive ban. It sounds like it's probably limited the same way that uh, that Council Klein described, and only insofar as municipal use of pesticides. That's correct. Right? It's a complete ban of use of pesticides on municipal land. And, and we it also, however, have. Go ahead, it's, um, um, it's also a ban on schools, school property. So, despite what our information <coughs> was about us regulating school property, right. Marblehead, I spoke with them a lot. They described their approach to this, and it's an old policy, is that they have a very different culture than we do. And so they feel very, very strongly, I'm not saying we don't, but they got ahead of this a long time ago. Right. And so they feel that even the enforcement of it, they have some stiff fines, is <coughs> not a problem because everyone is brought into it. Well, in, in, so there is an oversight committee of some sort. I mean, they have a different yeah. municipal structure than yeah. we do. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there is a there's an appointed body, an elected body that does appointed. oversight, yeah. and um, and then of course it's the same body that reviews exemptions. Or, or yeah. okay, all right, yeah. okay, thanks. That's that. I mean, and I and I see that East Amp does something similar, although they they actually specify EPA categories one and two. Mm -hmm. I don't know what those. I don't know what's contained in those categories. They're the most harmful. They're the most harmful. So the most, you know, identified carcinogens and. Um, okay. Well, some chemicals I have learned from Kate can can be labeled and they're in the table this way, two through four. It depends on the route of exposure how harmful they are. So I see. For some exposures, they're very, very toxic, and for other exposures, they're less toxic, like inha inhalation versus dermal. Right, absorption through the skin. Okay. And um, so, so that that's a little more granular than a comprehensive ban on, I mean, the, the one that Marblehead has is literally any any basically man-made generated product that to be applied as it's OMRI standards which is a national organics um, management organization so they comply with OMRI standards in terms of what they can and can't use so it's organic it, it's an organic mandate okay um, although they do have uh, a waiver an exemption policy for emergencies okay mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. thank you Anyone who hasn't spoken? Uh, if not, I will turn to Council Klein. <laughs> well, it's kind of a, a point of clarification, too. Um, in speaking to the city solicitor about not being able to include the schools, we know that the um, city of, I'm totally blanking out, what's the city that just banned glyphosate? Newburyport. <laughs> Newburyport. Yeah. Newburyport. Newburyport. Yes, yeah. Thank you. So Newburyport, for instance, which is a city, not a town, um, to make that distinction that's made in Mass General Law, just banned glyphosate um, on school property as well as other municipal properties. And, um, and Marblehead, which is a town, not a city, so it, it complies with other Mass General Laws around um, what can be mandated and can't be mandated by their town council um, has a citywide ban that includes schools as well. In talking to the city solicitor about this and saying, here we have precedent, other towns and cities in Massachusetts have in fact uh, been able to pass legislation that applies to schools as well, his feeling was it's not actually in compliance with Mass General Law for cities. Um, it's different for the town of Marblehead, but Newburyport, for instance, with glyphosate, um, it, it made a decision, passed a law that is not in keeping. This is the city solicitor's interpretation of Mass General Law. Um, and that it's not considered a precedent because legal cases set precedents. Other cities or towns doing something doesn't set precedents. So we were given very clear instructions that we couldn't have um, our 
ordinance uh, apply to schools. So that's just a, a clarification I think that's important to make. Hmm. And uh, I just want to point out, and, and perhaps there will be some changes in our in Massachusetts legislature that will, will, uh, will help us statewide uh, accomplish these things, but in New York State, pesticides are not allowed on any school property, period, on, on, on any school grounds, so. Mm. Actually, um, several states in the United States, yeah. So I, uh, I imagine they still play football and soccer, but uh, they, don't, they don't manage them with chemicals like we do. Okay. Thank you. Well, good. And um, I'm sorry, come, come on up. And this time, and give your name for the record, if you will. Yes, uh, uh, Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia Swopus. Um, every single school in the in the Commonwealth has to have an integrated pest management plan. That's in our report. And surrounding communities, I'll just give you an example: Amherst and East Hampton. Their integrated pest management plan for their playing fields outdoors said they do not use any pesticides. Ours is very different. We list all the pesticides that we use in Northampton. So we do have surrounding communities that have made a commitment, schools, schools that have made the commitment to be 100% organic on all their playing fields. Mm -hmm. That's good information to know. Thank you. Um, anything else? I'm, I'm mindful of not going too far on this because we, we there is an ordinance that um, is in process, and we're not here to discuss that particular ordinance tonight. Uh, but I would call for any other questions or general comments about the report itself. Um, hearing none. Oh, excuse me, the Council for Ward Three. Yeah. So um, I, you know, I I want to thank Councilor Klein for the opportunity to sponsor the resolution to create this committee. I think the outcome has been really quite remarkable. I mean, I, I've. I keep going back to this report to, you know, there was the initial report, the read through, and then to keep reading through for tonight, I'm like, wow, we did really great work. And um, so I'm very impressed with what we did. Um, and um, I also want to recognize uh, uh, Cynthia, Adele, and Kate for, you know, the terrific work that they did. I mean, they, this was a high-powered, brainy committee, and, and it, was, it was pretty cool to be part of that. Um, and um, the, the last thing is that uh, we have nine recommendations here. And as the counselor who will be moving on into the next term, I want to you know, publicly commit to uh, seeing that these nine recommendations uh, are acted on in some way. So um, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Klein. As the councillor who's not moving on in the council, <laughs> um, I want to commit as a citizen to kind of shepherding this as much as uh, the council will allow me to and the, the residents of Northampton will allow me to. And I actually just want to add my thanks to, to the committee. It was amazing. We met twice a week um, for many weeks um, for two, two and a half hour meetings. We held two public forums. We synthesized so many um, emails. We responded to every email that we received. I mean, it was just an enormous amount of work and it was done with so much dedication. And, um, and like Jim said, they, it was a brainy committee. It was really an honor to, to work with all of the members of the committee. So I wanna say thank you too. I think that sentiment is echoed by the entire council. Thank you again. Um, you know, just for the record, I heard some <coughs> comment about influence from the chemical industry generally on this issue. Just, can you assure me that there was no influence from the, the goat industry in terms of organic management and providing tasty grass for goat seeds? All right, I'm sorry for that. Uh, that concludes this this part. Uh, but we have another presentation. You achieved a new low with that, Jim. <laughs> no even followed what I said. So the next presentation we have also stars Adele Franks. So, I'm gonna just set it up and then Darren's gonna take it from there. All right. Um, so this, is this, is a, this is about building codes. I'm just gonna read this for the record. <laughs> I'm so this is put it. on a different hat. This is my. Oh, you have your other hat on? Yeah, I got yeah. my other hat on. And so this for the record is a presentation discussion of Energy Efficient Codes Coalition, EECC, voting guide for the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, IECC. Take it away. So just for general context, the ICC, which is the International Code, Code 
Council, thank you. It's a nonprofit organization that generates 15 different kinds of building codes. Um, include, and one of them is the one we're going to talk about tonight, which is the IECC, which is the International Energy Conservation Code. And of course, building codes and especially energy conservation codes are very important. If, we, if we're ever going to reach our climate goals, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And about, I don't know, 30 to 40 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. So the ICC generates these 15 different codes that they want to be considered model codes. And then the states can adopt them or not. Now, Massachusetts does adopt the IECC. Um, it can also amend it if, if, uh, only if it makes it stricter, which it has actually in the past. So there's uh, three year cycles um, for these codes. And um, if, you, uh, if you can put up that slide, there's a very interesting graph that um, is, is worth a thousand words. Um, so then there's another acronym for you to digest, which is EECC, which is the Energy Efficiency Code Coalition, which is a, uh, an organization of, a coalition of many, many, many organizations, including architects and environmental organizations and in the insurance industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they were formed in 2007 uh, because they wanted to um, promote energy efficiency. And so they really wanted the ICC to um, do better in its IECC, its, in its Energy Conservation Code. So I wish I had a pointer, but if you look at the, if you, if you look at the blue line, uh, it starts in 77, the, the years are on the x-axis, it starts in 77, so 100% is basically just sort of like the baseline, is where we were, how, how much energy was being used by buildings in 1977. And then if you, if you follow that red dotted line down to the x-axis, that's, that's what they're calling the glide path to net zero. So that's how we would have to be improving our energy efficiency over all these years if we want to get by 2050 to net zero so that our buildings are emitting uh, no excess uh, carbon. So as you can see, after the EECC was formed, there, there was a period of time, there were two code cycles, 2009, 2012, where the energy efficiency drastically improved. That is, we, we reduced the amount of energy um, that buildings required. It was something like 38%. And then there was this slowdown, do you see that? 2012, 2015. Well, that, that seems to be because the um, ICC made a deal with the um, National Home Builders Association that they would put the home builders, four members of the whole Home Builders Association onto their committees, onto all their committees. And the home builders don't really want energy efficiency and so they were very effective. Um, there, was a, there was a New York Times article in the last three weeks that exposed this deal that they, that they, they made with them. So the effort uh, that the EECC has been making over this last year has been to get more voting members signed up to vote on the Code Council because um, municipalities um, can vote on this. But in the last code cycle, uh, very few people voted. It was something like uh, 500 people voted out of you know thousands and thousands of people who were eligible to vote. In our last code cycle, Northampton, for example, had one voter, uh, but as a result of all these efforts, to enroll, get municipalities more engaged in this process. This year, this code cycle, we have 20 people signed up to vote. And, th and the reason for it's coming before you all tonight is because four of those people are city councilors. And I believe you need to approve what they're gonna, how they're gonna vote. So, if you can see uh, between the red dotted lines, there's a blue line that, um, that says, Boy, it sure is hard to see from here, isn't it? 2021 I IECC question mark. <laughs> That's if we get a, make it bigger. if we get a, 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 another 500 or so uh, pro efficiency voters to vote on this next code <laughs> cycle, which is coming up in the next. The voting is has actually started, and then it goes for the next couple of weeks. Nice. We could make that much improvement. It's about a 10 percent improvement, and get us back on a downward slope towards the net zero glide path. So. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Darren who can talk 
more technically. Okay. Darren is here. Yes. So. Hi. Uh, Darren Port, uh, Buildings and uh, Community Solutions Manager for NEEP, which is the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership. NEEP is one of the six Rio's regional energy efficiency organizations uh, that are throughout the country. So uh, NEEP's territory is D.C. to Maine and West Virginia. So we represent the uh, 13 mid-Atlantic and northeastern states. And I work directly with all the state energy offices from D.C. to Maine and West Virginia uh, to assist them in adopting new building energy codes, uh, and particularly zero energy codes and zero energy policy. So a little bit of my role. Uh, NEEP in general, uh, we're based in Lexington, however I live here in, in East Hampton. Uh, our mission uh, organizationally is decarbonization uh, and energy efficiency uh, throughout the region. So getting to the carbon goals of 80% reduction by 2050 or hopefully sooner than, than that. Um, so as Adele said, we're in a uh, interesting period of time. Uh, 20, 2019 happens to be a code year uh, uh, cycle. So it's every three years that codes are developed. So as you saw there, it was like 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. And the next version will be 2021. So that needs to begin sooner. So we're in that year now. Uh, there's been a series of uh, public hearings where proposals have been heard. Uh, the proposals have been submitted by uh, all kinds of folks across the country, uh, architects, designers, building scientists, uh, product manufacturers. Anybody can submit a proposal to the International Code, Site, uh, Code Council, the ICC, to, uh, to strengthen or to weaken the next version of the code. Uh, so there is uh, two hearings. At the first hearing, uh, a select committee uh, votes on their proposals. Uh, and as Adele said, this committee now is composed of four members of national building organization that is generally opposed to uh, efficiency and has uh, unfortunately caused some detriment to efficiency gains in uh, energy codes over the years. Once the committee votes, then uh, there's a public comment period where folks can then uh, add additional comments uh, as to the committee's actions. Then there's another uh, large public hearing, uh, which just happened in Las Vegas, where the actions of the committee can uh, either be uh, overturned, affirmed, uh, or there is that sometimes some of the proposals during the first hearing are modified. Uh, so those proposals that are modified uh, then are voted on by the membership that are at the second hearing. So a little bit down in the weeds, uh, but at the end, uh, there are now uh, some, uh, well, for your interest in the energy efficiency, about 250 different proposals uh, that will affect the efficiency of the next International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, so before you as a voting guide, uh, or two voting guides, uh, there is the EECC uh, voting guide that is about the top 70 proposals. Uh, so these are the proposals that would lend the most efficiency to the next version of the code. Uh, and the graph that Adele showed you is that, you know, in the past two code cycles, all we've gotten is about 3% increase in efficiency. So it's really vital if we're going to get to the goal of a zero energy code by 2040, 2050, that we start making some efficiency gains. The ICC was on the trajectory of getting to a zero energy code by 2050, but because of the situation with the builders, that's now been, again, derailed. So uh, it's, it's very important that we gain some efficiency. So what e EECC did was a uh, very concerted effort to get all the eligible voters that could vote uh, registered and voting. Uh, so in the last code cycle, there was uh, about 14,000 people nationally that could have voted. Only 834 across the country voted. So that's 800 people 
you know, with the fate of energy efficiency for the entire country in their hands. Uh, so now uh, we're back into the thousands that are registered as potential voters. Massachusetts alone has 420 registered voters this, for this round. So Massachusetts can actually affect the energy code all on its own. Uh, and so that's a great position for us to be in, considering we're number one state in the country for efficiency, it, it only makes sense, so. And that's, so thank you for that. And yeah. I guess one thing that would be especially important for us to understand, and you're probably getting to this, is what are the recommendations that, yeah. uh, I mean, there's a lot of money. <coughs> I don't know if you can go down each one in, in tremendous detail, but how? Um, how yeah, I don't think you'd want me to do that. We'd be here for <laughs> quite a while, but I, I can some kind speak of generally. Yeah, yeah, some kind of. Yeah. And, and just um, to add to what you said, yeah. um, so the process, at, and Adele, uh, the process was the city council referred the question of this matter to a committee of four people. And so that committee has had a meeting somewhat like this, but there's been more detailed discussion in that committee. And it was the council's decision that uh, the final vote, uh, we want the whole council to ratify the final vote. So the committee has already made a recommendation, which is basically to adopt these recommendations that we see on the screen. Is that correct, committee member? Um, Ask the chair and the uh, sponsors. Is that basically correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Would you agree, Councillor Klein? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so it's, it's therefore a public, a, a, a succinct but accurate public discussion about what these recommendations are, as complex as they are, would, would be very valuable. Yeah, so there are uh, many different proposals. The majority of them increase efficiency. Uh, the minority of them decrease efficiency, but they are so significant uh, that they would, would curtail the amount of efficiency gains. So there are proposals that, for instance, uh, increase the efficiency of lighting. Uh, so the lighting density for particular types of uh, indoor environments. There is a proposal that would uh, put an, uh, an appendix into the code that would be a zero energy appendix. So a uh, state or an adopting municipality that were interested in getting the energy code to a zero energy code uh, could adopt that appendix and therefore require all new buildings, all new construction uh, to be a zero energy uh, building. There are important proposals that uh, would allow for uh, all buildings or certain types of buildings uh, to be EV ready, so electric vehicle ready. Uh, so it's imperative if we're gonna meet our climate goals uh, that we have more electric vehicles on the road. An easy way to, to uh, pave that road to more EVs is to have uh, homeowners have the convenience of, of having their buildings be EV ready. Uh, same with <coughs> solar. Uh, so instead of having to retrofit a home after it's built, why not build that home uh, solar ready? So that means just having the electrical chases in place, having space left on the wall where the inverter would go and the, the uh, having a slot for, for the circuit breaker and the breaker box things like that. So those are some of the more significant proposals. Uh, so it ranges from those sort of macro concepts like EV ready, solar ready, uh, all the way down to the uh, efficiency of windows, the efficiency or the thermal resistance of uh, particular walls, how much glazing you can have in a wall. Um, how much uh, skylight penetration is permitted. So it gets into uh, you know, s the smallest detail of building construction, the assemblies, how things go together, uh, air sealing, really uh, every component of, of the <coughs> environment. That's very, okay, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Um, do you wanna 
stop there and have a pick up with a conversation from counselors or do you have more to add from the no I'm so really more here I didn't have formal uh, yeah. uh, uh, comments per se you yeah. know I just certainly want to encourage everyone that is registered to vote that could vote to definitely do it it makes a difference uh, and, and I'm here just to offer technical assistance to any questions that uh, that you may have yeah and, and you making the effort to be here tonight is much appreciated yeah. so so thank you and that's a lot of great information so with that, uh, counselors, uh, questions or discussions? Discussion items? Uh, Councilor Dwight. Well, I, I, um, as a member of the Energy and Sustainability Committee, we've been discussing this for a while, actually. Uh, once again, thanks to Adele, actually bringing it to our notice and, 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 and emphasizing the urgency. Um, again, another brainy group of which I have the privilege of hanging around sort of basking in but not not really participating in quite the level that they do but um, given that the, the there's been an ongoing discussion about climate change and its impacts and the in the in the daunting goal of trying to reach net zero and reduce our our, our, our carbon output and also at the same time um, you know the two pillars of conservation and then also uh, employing renewable energy systems the whole the the whole ethos of that committee this this sort of corresponds with that uh, brilliantly the uh, what Adele laid out is actually uh, we weren't aware that we had the opportunity to spread out um, voting status for a number of groups and when we discovered that the city council could also qualify as one of the voting groups here in the in the city we we uh councilor klein uh in particular led the way in trying to figure out how we can make this work and i think it's somewhat unprecedented i'm not sure but with the fact that uh, trying to get us relative luddites up to speed on these things and trying to figure out how to go so uh, and with the council president's work, we <laughs> we're try to make massage that in such a way so that it does work. And so this is a long way of asking, uh, what was the discussion in the course of the resource group? Uh, um, was there any debate relative to these issues, or was there more or less consensus with uh, abiding by these recommendations? Councillors asked a question which is now hanging in the center of the room and any councillor may reach for it. Maybe the chair would start. I'll take it. Um, so we had we had a great discussion at Community Resources and Darren and Adele were both there and, um, and gave presentations but also answered sort of more specific questions. And we also just really talked about the process of voting. This is a fairly convoluted, complicated system um, in every facet of it. And sort of, Darren sort of talked a little bit about how um, the recommendations come to be, and it's it's fascinating the whole process. But um, it took us a while to wrap our heads around it. So um, we, so I think we had a good discussion and came to an understanding of the voting guides that we think will be most helpful um, for us to use. Because in addition, so and there, am I, I'm correct that there are significantly more than these, right? These are like yes, there yeah. there's over 200. Right. So this is just like a sample, but the <laughs> important the sample. Top. Yes. Seven. So um, I think that we, the committee, feels confident in taking um, their advice and using the voting guide to be able to vote, and we're hoping that you will um, give us your consent to do so. Thank you, Councilor. Karen, uh, so as Adele pointed out. If, if all these recommendations are basically codified, um, that the hope is that there's a, a getting back on course to zero, um, it's about 10%, was that the estimate? Yeah, they're looking at like 10 to 12% potential efficiency gain uh, from the proposals that are on hand. Uh, and it, just is there a possibility they could even go further than that? There is a possibility some of the dependency <laughs> measures uh, could get us always to zero. Not as a code as a whole. Again, that was that's an appendix. So if 
uh, BBRS and DOER decided to adopt those appendices and make them mandatory, uh, the, the state would, would go all the way to a zero energy code. And you know, that, that is something that is in play currently. Uh, in fact, DOER uh, has recommended to the BBRS that they adopt a zero energy stretch code. So the next version of the stretch code for green communities would be a zero energy stretch code. So it would be aspirational to where the state would get to uh, as a whole. And how that sort of dovetails with what's at hand here tonight and with the voting is that that stretch code wouldn't necessarily be in place until this 2021 code is in place. So some of the uh, provisions, some of, that, some of the proposals, if we can get them codified into code, it would just ease the way to getting to that stretch code because the, it would already be in code language. So currently what happens now is that if DOER wants to increase the efficiency of the code beyond the provisions that are on there, they have to make a recommendation to the BBRS. It has to go through a whole process to public hearings uh, and, and so forth. Uh, whereas if it's already in the code uh, and we adopt the code as a whole, it just eases the path to get to the reduced carbon and, and greater efficiency. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sharon. I just add one thing. I also, I really, really want to thank Laura, who, in addition to Darren and Adele, did like a truly tremendous amount of work on this. and. Um, really delved into this to a remarkable degree. So thank you, Laura. You've really done a huge, huge service to all of us. So thank you. Anything else? Councilor Bidwell. Um, I, I would just add that um, at the conversation we had at Community Resources with, with, with Adele and, and you, Darren, we, we talked about the fact that uh, energy efficiency, efficiency gains sometimes come, well, almost always comes at the cost of the initial expense in, in, in new construction, which has affordability implications. And we, we had a good discussion about that, didn't necessarily have good solutions to it, but we are, I think we should all be mindful of the fact that there are construction cost implications to this and affordability implications to this. And we all know that one of the leading contributors to wealth inequality is housing cost. And so, uh, uh, the, the flip side of this is even more expensive housing. Um, I'm not saying, uh, I'm obviously gonna support this, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna vote for it, because we, we have to do it, but we all need to recognize that we, we need additional resources coming from the public sector to make, to make housing more affordable at the same time that we move in the direction of, uh, of eventually zero net energy. Sure, yeah, if, if I can respond. You know, certainly the, the first cost issue is always a concern. Uh, you know, that is the biggest uh, issue that the builders raise is, is first costs. Uh, however, uh, once you're over that hurdle of first costs, and that is dropping all the time. Uh, Massachusetts chapter of the United States Green Building Council uh, just put out a report that states that to get to zero energy buildings, and they, these buildings have been built in Massachusetts, uh, commercial buildings, high rise commercial buildings, you're looking at just a one year payback. Uh, on the residential side, so there could be increased first cost, uh, you know, cost to entry, uh, but the operating costs over the life cycle of that building are so great that you recuperate uh, the cost very quickly. Each proposal that is proposed to be voted on has to have a maximum seven year payback period. Uh, so, and many come in uh, less than that. Um, you know, and then folks will go, well, can you put a price on comfort? Can you put a price on resiliency, uh, better indoor air quality, things that are the ancillary benefits of an increased efficiency code? Um, so those kind of things, you know, the reduced health care costs, if you would, you know, redistribute the dollars that are saved uh, from treating asthma to uh, making more efficient buildings, then you would have an equilibrium at, at some point and first cost wouldn't be as big an issue important part of the debate for sure. Yes. Um, anything else from the council? Uh, later the council will vote on an order that concludes the city council hereby approves the recommendations relative to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, IECC, 
that are reflected in the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition Voting Guide and authorizes the members of the community to vote in accordance with the guide. So if you have questions about what exactly is in this voting guide, granular uh, questions or any point of confusion, I take it all counselors have examined the voting guide. Um, now would be a good time to ask those questions. Otherwise, I feel confident we've had two uh, very uh, helpful presentations about this matter tonight. Okay, hearing no further questions, Mr. Port, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Franks, thank you again. Okay. The eighth member of the city council <laughs> from Ward 8, wherever that is. And um, so good. So now that takes care of our presentations, and this thing is going to come up later. Uh, very quickly, the consent agenda. I will read the items at the request of anyone counselor. I will remove the items for a separate vote, otherwise there's no debate on the consent agenda, which contains, first, the minutes of November 7th, 2019. Second, 19169, application for supervised display of fireworks for first night. The applicant is Northampton uh, Arts Council. Time and day of display, New Year's Eve, first night, 1231, well, not first night, 1231, 2019. Uh, at 6.15 p.m. Location, rooftop of John E. Uh, Gare, parking garage, uh, 85 Hampton Avenue. So vote will be the equivalent of granting that application. Next, uh, a vote on these will be equivalent to referral of these appointments to the Committee on City Services, chaired by Councilor Carney. To the Disability Commission would be Marilyn E. Clare of 256 Ple uh, Pleasant Street, number 4 and 4 Northampton, a term 2019 of November to June 2022. Uh, to the Public Shade Tree Commission for the same term would be David Lukens of 45 Ridgewood Terrace, North Hampton. Any removals? Hearing none. Is removal? Move approval second. of the uh, consent agenda. Made by Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Barge. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? So that is approved. At this time, we will recess for the Committee on Finance, chaired by Councilor Murphy. Laura, would you call our roll, please? Here. 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 Excellent. Uh, we have a short agenda tonight. The first thing is to approve our minutes of November 7th. Do we have a motion? A motion. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, the first item is 19171 in order to reprogram funds from River Road to Pine Street Bridge Repair Project. To order that. $207,325 of surplus funds that remain in the River Road Retraining Wall project remaining from unused city matching funds be reprogrammed for the stabilization, engineering, and repairs of the Pine Street Bridge. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second? Second. And the mayor will explain to us. Yes. Um, so this is, uh, again, some surplus funds from the River Road Retaining Wall project that was a capital project that's been completed. Um, the uh, Mass DOT uh, did an inspection of the Pine Street Bridge uh, back at the end of March of 2019. Um, uh, and this was a periodic inspection that they do routinely. Um, we were just notified on November 7th, uh, 2019, um, that there were some um, structural issues identified with the bridge that we need to address. Um, the bridge is still usable at this point, but they've ordered some emergency uh, uh, modifications to it. Um, which will require us to do some emergency engineering um, and obviously some emergency procurement. Um, there are a couple of um, uh, beams that uh, need some shoring um, as well as potentially some replacement of a beam uh, that has um, had some deterioration. Um, because it's a bridge that goes over um, the Mill River, it's, not a, it's a little bit more of a complicated project. Um, so we don't know what the final cost of it will be. Um, but we need the ability to sign a contract and be able to engage um, engineering services and, uh, we, and, and get this initial work underway. So what we're asking to do is to um, reprogram these funds that we know are available and are already approved to a Pine Street Bridge Repair Project. Um, and you'll see it's just over 200000 that's in that. We may not need all of those funds, but um, the director just wants to have the ability, um, especially knowing that winter is coming, uh, it's going to require uh, erection of scaffolding um, in the river um, to get under the bridge um, and some other repair work. So that's what this is about. Did they happen to say why it took them the entire construction season to drop a dime and tell us what they found in March? I do not know. Uh, <laughs> the mysteries of the Commonwealth. 
staffs. I don't know how many bridge inspectors there are. I don't know how long it takes to write reports, but um, they come and do inspections, and, um, and we wait to hear what the results are. So they were delivered to us um, a little while ago, and then we had to do some quick uh, work um, to figure out what it would entail. So, um, and they're actually are still going to be doing some initial. Um, they still haven't given us a final uh, decision on what what it is we need to do. Um, we're hope we don't believe the bridge will need to be closed. There may be a section of the bridge that may need to be closed, which may narrow um, the travel lanes um, for a period of time. Um, this is very similar to what happened, you may recall, in 91 a few years ago, where they basically shut down a lane um, the Friday before like Labor Day weekend, um, conveniently, um, because of a, a similar beam issue that had to be addressed. So again, uh, we are at their mercy, and, um, and obviously we want to make sure that these safety matters are addressed. So that's what this funding would provide. Any questions for the, uh, the mayor on this one? Councillor Klein. Curious about the surplus funds because I know that we've um, used surplus funds from the River Road project for other things. Is this the remainder of that money? And the one of the reasons I'm asking is I remember at some point in a discussion with um, Wayne Fiden that that money was going to be rerouted for something else in that area. I thought in Leeds. No, there have been several River Road related projects. There was a retaining wall project, and then uh, there was also a um, sewer, sewer, yeah. sewer repair one. project as well. So I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how that would. Uh, yeah, this would be a bridge. This would be a you know a project that was you know an infrastructure repair project that we're rerouting to another infrastructure repair. Pro I don't, I'm not sure what Mr. And Biden it's the did. entire surplus that's left. That we, we want to have yes, project. but we may not use it all. But we just don't want to have to knowing the speed with which we may have to make these pr repairs and procurement. We don't want to take the risk that we'd have to come back to council to then mm -hmm. try to reprogram additional funds. Um, so that's what we're doing. I don't know what project Mr. Fiden might be referring to, but um, that would have this, whatever his project is, it is not an emergency repair. So that's why we really need to have these funds. Available. Check with him. Thank you. Yep. Other questions for the mayor on this one? All right, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Great. And the next is 19. I just want to say I was going to, I am going to ask if the council will take two readings on this. To the council meeting. We need to get um, a going. Job, just uh, sure. we lose the season altogether. Yes. So the next one is a 19172, an order to reprogram $1,660 from the AOM LED lights to the AOM handicapped ramp project. Order that $1,660 of surplus funds remaining from the AOM stage lighting project. That's AOM is Academy of Music. Um, be reprogrammed to the Academy of Music Handicap Ramp Project to allow for additional drainage work related to the ramp. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second? Second. 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 Okay. Um, uh, the council may remember uh, funding the, um, the Academy of Music Handicap Ramp Project, which is a project to create handicapped access to the backstage area of the Academy of Music, which currently doesn't have it. Um, if you've driven by there recently, you, you can see that the, um, the area is prepped and there's little uh, sono tubes that have been poured and um, the actual ramp itself is being fabricated right now for installation. It'll look very similar to the black um, metal that uh, fire escapes that were recently put in, um, so it'll sort of fit in with the character of the building. As part of that project, they discovered um, a, some drainage issues. Uh, that needed to be addressed in terms of the uh, drain system coming off the building um, and sort of in that particular area. So they um, have some leftover funds from the previous stage lighting project that Mr. Pomerantz would like to have reprogrammed to this handicapped ramp project to be able to address those uh, drainage concerns. Mm -hmm. Questions for the mayor on this? No? Hearing none. Then all uh, in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any new business? Yep. Hearing none, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Hi, we, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. We are back in the full city council. Mr. Um, we are going to move. Uh, yes. I was wondering if it would be possible to consider moving up an ordinance. Yep, that's what I was in the middle to say. So mm -hmm. you're going to request uh, Bridge Street first. Okay, we have a bunch of stuff. We're gonna move uh, and yeah, oh, good. I was yeah. going to ask if we could also bring the. 
uh, based on uh, all the folks who were sitting here who were probably getting a wonderful civic education, I'm sure they'd like the opportunity to go home sooner. And if um, so we're gonna, we're gonna do Safe City, we're gonna do Bridge Street, and we're gonna probably do some zoning ordinances for our senior land use planner. And then only us would be parking. That's what we're Not the parking for these folks? Bridge Street, yep, that's what Thank I'm gonna you. do. All right, so I hear a motion from Councillor Dwight, perhaps? To move, which one? Why don't we do? Uh, uh, why don't we do Bridge Street parking first? And then. Is that 19, the very first? Nine, nine, nine. That's well, nineteen one five nine. All right. So Councillor Dwight moves nineteen one. That. Oh, one five nine. The other. There we go. Gosh, you were already at the already at the end. Yeah. You really saved your <laughs> bacon. Uh, nineteen one five nine. An ordinance to amend section three twelve one zero. Nine, to convert six long-term parking space on Bridge Street to two-hour parking. Councilor Dwight moves approval. Second. And seconded by Councilor um, Murphy. Okay, so discussion on this, please. Councilor Nash. Yeah, uh, so um, we had some discussion about this last time, and it had to do with long-term parking spaces. And um, the uh, I made a commitment to um, have that discussion at the TPC, which was uh, earlier this week. And, um, and in the meantime, uh, hearing our concern about the, the lack of long-term spaces, uh, the mayor's office sent forward some proposals that went to the TPC for consideration the other day to create new long-term parking uh, further up on Bridge Street and further down on Pleasant Street. Um, those proposals are at the T are going to remain at the TPC until next month so we can do some outreach to, um, uh, to the public. So I'm letting people know that uh, we will have a discussion about long-term spaces on Bridge Street and on Pleasant Street. Um, and that also, uh, as the chair, I took the prerogative to put this item on the agenda to have the TPC weigh in. Um, though it was out of order in terms of the way we do things, um, I just knew that uh, the TPC would appreciate the opportunity and they sent this uh, uh, forward to council with a positive recommendation. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you for doing that, I think you to do that. I think it is important that the Transportation and Parking Commission review parking related ordinances, stunningly, uh, before the City Council act on them. So, thank you. And you have further comments. I, I just wanted to say uh, that, that, that we are looking at that issue of long-term parking and that discussion is going on. I just wanted to underline that that's happening. Other comments? Parking? Yeah, it's, it's a complicated situation. I, I don't uh, necessarily expect you to solve all the issues before we act. So, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, discussion that you'll have in that commission. Thank you. But you've positively recommended this specific ordinance to the council. Yeah, this one. Very good. 159. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so you have further comments. I just wanted to, if there's a chance we could do two readings on this. That would be a motion that would be in order if someone wishes to make it. Uh, but right now we are on first reading to approve. Any further discussion on this? Okay. So hearing no other discussion, we have a roll call. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labard. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Move to suspend rules, please. Second. Second. Okay, your motion to suspend rules will allow for two readings, made by Councillor Dwight, second by Councillor Klein. Any discussion on the suspension of rules? Hearing none, all those in uh, favor of suspending the rule say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Rules are suspended. Move uh, move approval on the second reading. Second. Okay. And by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Bart's uh, uh, debate on second reading. Councilor Sharon. I get a second bite of the apple. Um, can I just ask Councilor Nash and maybe Councilor Dwight um, if there's any discussion around um, informing, it, since this would be a fast change of these. Um, 
spaces from long term, will there be signs on them or is, was there any discussion on how we're going to inform the public who maybe parks there long term regularly um, that this change will have happened and they might not be expecting it? I will have notices hung on each one. Awesome. Thank when you. you. When you give out the permits or when they buy the permits every month? I don't hand out permits. We'll, we'll provide yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other discussion on second reading? All right. Um, so let's have a roll call, please. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labard. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. And Councillor Bidwell. Yes. If for some reason you've been parking next to Pops and the Roos for 10 hours at a time, you soon will not be able to do that anymore. All right, because that passes on second to the mayor for a signature. Uh, now uh, we have, let's see, let's do a safe city, shall we? Uh, item, um, I would move item 19.153, safe Northampton safe city ordinance. All right, uh, 19.153 is, is Councilor Dwight said perfectly, uh, safe city ordinance. Uh, who seconds that motion, please? Second. Uh, and so um, my, my voice is a little parched. I would like to ask perhaps um, one of the sponsors, perhaps Councillor Klein as the, the lead sponsor, if she would read this into the record. Um, we sometimes do that as opposed to me saying everything. Because who wants to hear me talk all day? Councillor, would you be willing to do that? Sure. Um, as amended in legislative matters. Yes, as it's come to us uh, in its latest form. I understand there's a further amendment, but we'll have to adopt that in council. So, so this is um, 19.153, an ordinance establishing Northampton as a welcoming community, Northampton Safe City Ordinance. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended to? We don't know yet. Yeah, what's up with that? That's just... Um, um, Chapter 70 to add chapter 70 was the um, chapter reference that was agreed to but it would still have to be amended so we have to make that amendment on the floor tonight I think it should be as follows okay so be amended as over. follows um, but we will have to amend that on the floor this ordinance shall be known as the city of Northampton Safe City Ordinance and affirms that Northampton is a welcoming city that seeks to ensure public safety and trust between all members of our community. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, definitions. A, immigration enforcement refers to the federal agency, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and any other federal agency charged with the enforcement of immigration laws. B, immigration detainers or ICE detainers are requests made by federal immigration officials, including but not limited to those authorized under section 287.7 of Title VIII of the Code of Federal Regulations to local law enforcement or courts to voluntarily maintain custody of an individual once that individual is released from local custody and or to notify a federal agency before the pending release of an individual. C, eligible for release from custody means there is no judicial warrant, judicial order, or law that prevents an individual from being released from custody of the city. <coughs> Section two, policy. A, it is the policy of the city of Northampton that unless required by state and federal law, the city shall not take any action for the sole purpose of facilitating federal immigration enforcement, including providing non-mandatory information to any state or federal agency, B, furthermore, city resources shall not be used, um, one, to determine the immigration status of a person unless such inquiry is required by state or federal law or to provide a public benefit, two, to take action on the basis of actual or perceived immigration status unless to provide a public benefit, three, to detain or delay the release of an individual otherwise eligible for release from custody on the basis of an immigration detainer, Four, to perform the functions of an immigration officer, whether pursuant to 8 U.S. Code Section 1357G or any other law, regulation, or policy, whether formal or informal. C, notwithstanding Sections 2A, 1, and 2B, 2 above, 
A person's immigration status shall not prohibit or inhibit the city's participation in any government operation or program that confers an immigration benefit, including temporarily or permanently protecting non-citizens from removal as provided through programs such as the U visa, the T visa, and the Federal Violence Against Women Act. Section three, implementation. The mayor shall enforce this ordinance and promulgate the necessary policies, procedures, directives, and training necessary to effectively and faithfully enforce and implement this ordinance. B, nothing in this ordinance shall be construed to violate any valid federal law or to pro prohibit any city official from providing law enforcement agency citizenship or information status consistent with a U.S. code section 1373. Thank you very much. Um, so at this time, I'd ask if there is any opening comments or discussion from any council. Council Dwight. So as we've heard in public testimony and, and as it's also been noted that uh, the Northampton has a standing executive administrative policy order that, that prevents the police from acting. And the concern is that and as Javier actually testified before, this is actually somewhat redundant insofar as that it is our active policy. It also is, it's, it's interesting that we have to declare by ordinance that we are not going to, um, we are not obliged to abide by federal uh, orders from ICE, nor are we obliged to serve as federal agents in, um, in their activity and their pursuits. It, it is also the, so it, it actually, what we're doing more or less is reinforcing our commitment to um, protecting all residents of the city, particularly from a rather grotesque and aggressive campaign by the current administration and previous administrations as well, but not so as overt as this one, um, to essentially go after easily the most vulnerable people in our community who contribute to our tax base, who contribute to our welfare, who participate in all dimensions of, of, of being a civilian in the community, yet at the same time do not enjoy many of its benefits. And, at, and adding to that are actually subject to the constant threat and fear of a, of a pernicious federal government bent on uh, deporting them, uh, separating them from their families, separating them from the communities that they participate in. And this is essentially an overt expression of saying we will not be complicit. We will not participate in that grotesque policy. And, um, and so far as we know, the, the council, of course, is, has uh, already weighed in on this, but I think we all vote in concert in this, and I'm very proud of that. Thank you very much. Uh, is Councilor Klein, then Councilor Sheriff. You want to go ahead? Would you like me to? Councilor Klein is yielding to the Council from Ward 4, soon to be Councilor Large. Um, I was very happy to partner with my colleagues on this. Um, and I want to thank Jeff Napolitano, who's not here, but um, and, and those from the Resistance Center for your dedication and your work, um, and for your comments this evening, Ms. Franco and Ms. Gitman. Um, Northampton's been a real leader on this issue, and it's been heart, heart, um, heartening and gratifying to see other Western Mass communities passing safe city ordinances. Um, and you know, as we sort of wait and hold out some hope that the Commonwealth will take statewide action at some point, um, we really wanted to join in codifying um, by ordinance what, as Councilor Dwight said, has been our practice since 2014, which reflects our values and um, has been administrator, administrated by the, the mayor's executive order. Um, so, and also as, as Councilor Joyce said, you know, and, and was said at public comment, we're, we're certainly not closer now um, than we were then in 2014 to reasonable and humane federal approach to immigration. So um, it's vitally important that we preserve our commitment here um, and expand it throughout the municipality and and protect it against a change in, in administration here. So um, so I hope that you all will join us in in codifying what um, what has been 
something that we said that we, we believe very strongly in. So. Thank you very much. Councillor Klein. Well, I, I want to put a little bit of a finer point on what we're doing here today because um, people did come to me and ask saying, you know, we have this executive order from 2014. Um, why, why do we need to do this now? And my um, co-sponsors explained, um, but I think I want to put a finer point on how uh, things have evolved. Um, we, in 2014, three counselors, including myself, came forward with something at that time being called the Trust Act, which was essentially saying that, you know, cities will not be complicit with ICE, will not, um, will not hand over uh, our residents who are uh, undocumented. And because of the language of it that essentially instructed the, the police department um, what not to do, um, it was deemed that it needed to be, in fact, an executive order by the mayor, which um, we were very pleased that the mayor did in August. And the city council at the time, a couple months later, followed up with a resolution supporting, um, with very strong language, the mayor's executive order. I think that what we're doing here, we, we are codifying what is in the executive order, but we're also broadening and deepening it because we are making it a citywide policy. So it's not just the police department. We're talking about we're talking about any city resources. So for instance, if a family were to want uh, an undocumented family were to enroll their child in school, a school a school employee could not ask about immigration status. So we're talking about resources across the board um, in the city. Um, and, I, and I also feel like I, I just want to kind of address what is being called immigration policy in this, uh, this era of the, the current federal administration. Um, I don't even like to call it policy because I think it's so, um, it, it, it honors it by calling it policy. I think it, what's being perpetrated against immigrants in this country is actually um, racist uh, nativism and it's dehumanizing. So. Uh, what we're doing with immigrants in this country is is dehumanizing. Um, and I hope that you don't think I'm overstating things by saying that. And if, um, you know, if it feels like an overstatement to anyone, I think we need to consider how we're separating babies and toddlers and children from their parents and imprisoning them in deplorable conditions and internment camps that the government has established and employed on the border um, on our southern border. On November 13th, the AP reported that so far in 2019, the U.S. Um, is holding a record 69,550 migrant children in these camps, and they're separated from their parents. And um, we know that this leads to major psychological and physical harm and lasting trauma. Um, the detention camps, um, although they're deemed private or actually operated and overseen by the U.S. Border Patrol. And that means that U.S. government, the U.S. government is using our tax dollars to um, pay for these camps. And there's extensive documentation that the conditions in these camps for children and in the camps where adults are held as well are degrading at best and inhumane at their worst, including the use of solitary confinement for immigrants, um, the perpetration of sexual abuse, inadequate food and hygiene project products, no access to medical care, complete disregard for mental health uh, needs. There's also documentation that shows that the outcomes of this detainment um, include premature death and many cases of attempted and completed suicide. So we're seeing in real time um, how people are being affected, being held in detainment camps. And um, we also need to think about the levels of traumatization that our current so-called immigration policies inflicting on people in other ways. There are also anti-immigrant policies <laughs> in the forms of laws and administrative regulations that are being passed at every level in this country. So it's not just kind of border patrol. And some of the examples are um, HUD regulations now call for the eviction of over uh, 100,000 families of mixed immigration status. We're now deporting young Americans who have deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA status. Um, we're breaking up families that have temporary protected status, TPS. 
The Department of Homeland Security is actively working to change the definition of public <coughs> charge so that immigrants can't get Medicaid and food stamps. Um, on July 26th, the Trump administration signed the Safe Third Country deal with Guatemala to return asylum seekers from South and Central America to Guatemala, a country that has many of the same conditions that people were fleeing from um, in their countries. And the Director of Refugee Protection at Human Rights First said of this deal, refugees returned to Guatemala will be targets of violence, trafficking, and other persecution. The Trump administration is delivering refugees to a place where their lives are at risk. So these policies at every level of government um, are just a small taste of what this country is currently doing to immigrants and their lives. <laughs> I feel like it absolutely behooves us as a municipality to do our utmost to push back against this inhumane treatment of human beings. And um, we really need to employ our municipal power to push back against what I think are really atrocious um, injustices, inhumane injustices. This is our opportunity to protect the residents of our community who are undocumented because we can't expect the Trump administration to do so. So just um, finally, in considering this ordinance, let's not forget that multiple courts nationwide have ruled that ICE detainers are requests. They're not mandatory orders. And um, despite this, ICE has issued more than 2 million voluntary detainers over the last decade. And these detainers have led to 70% of ICE arrests under Trump. So let's... Um, be the city that we claim to be, a welcoming and safe city that says no to being complicit with the ICE, with ICE, and uh, please join me in voting yes on this ordinance. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, others? Councilor Dwight again. It's worth also noting that um, the mayor is prepared to complement this ordinance with executive policy that goes, expands further to across all departments. So that was his commitment to us as we were negotiating this and the maintaining um, the concern over separation of powers. So it's, it, I, I don't want to let this pass without acknowledging that the mayor has is, is, uh, stepped up and is supporting this and will, uh, uh, will actually make it policy, municipal policy, adding to his already standing policy. So noted. Councillor Labar. Yes. Um, I want to thank Councillor Dwight because I did have a lot of concerns about the language on the separation of powers. And I also received some calls from residents on that situation, too. I had a lengthy talk with Chief Jody Casper of my concerns about this, and I'm very pleased with the article that I actually saw in the Gazette with the mayor today and explaining to people about the separation of powers and so forth like that. Um, I think this ordinance is great and it is going to protect um, our residents here who are undocumented in this city. I think it's great. There's a lot of protection here and I'm very proud of it. And I want to thank the sponsors for that. Thank you, Councillor. Other me members of the Council? Councillor Bidwell. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors as well and, uh, and the Mayor. I think it's totally appropriate that we take uh, what is now a strong executive order and codify it as an ordinance because mayors do come and go. So I think it's uh, very important that this be a standing ordinance of, 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 of City Council and I also appreciate the fact that it broadens to all uh, municipal employees. I, j I just had one question about uh, uh, wording the, the the reference the the, the, the uh, actually it's section 2b1 the if, if the sponsors could explain to me the use of the term public benefit here as as one of the one, one of the exceptions to, to, to when municipal resources could be used uh, in the case of state or federal law or to provide a public benefit and, and what I don't quite understand the meaning of public benefit in this context, if someone could explain that to me. Councilor Klein? I think um, if you look at C, actually it, it gives you some examples. Um, 
uh, U visa, T visa, and the Federal Violence Against Women Act are all programs that the federal government has that assist immigrants. Um, and if uh, their immigration status makes them eligible for that assistance, that it is appropriate. That's why, in other words, to, is to provide the benefits of a public program to an immigrant. Yes. As opposed to somehow benefiting, benefiting the public. I, th uh, that was, I, I thought that's what the intent was, but it was, it's just a little bit ambiguous. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it rises to the level of uh, wanting to consider a, an amendment, but I do, I do understand the distinction. Um, no, I, I'm done. I was going to oh, go on well, to something else. Like I'm sorry. Is there some other? Uh, just to provide additional information, I mean, as I understand, the U visa, T visa, Violence Against Women Act, all have protections ag specifically against deportation. You know, if you come forward under certain circumstances and your circumstances qualify, then you have that extra protection. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if public benefit means something that and on top of it, perhaps it is also more general meaning, which it would be in the public interest to maintain. If there are other general public benefits that would ever at any point be given to marginalized communities, for example, you wouldn't want to prevent the city from being able to give those out um, under any circumstances. Right. So and just f because I'm a know-it-all, I always like to provide that. <laughs> no, that's important okay. because, you know, in fact, I, I mentioned about um, how HUD policy has changed and is removing um, families with mixed immigration status. But for instance, as just as, as an example, if there were um, HUD, um, what are they called? Not titles, HUD, um, you, you could utilize HUD as an immigrant family, for instance, and you needed to have that status, you could, in fact, get a HUD voucher, a voucher. Uh, okay. Interesting. Something like that. Other discussion? Oh, Councilor Quinn. I have a, um, a small kind of uh, amendment that I'd like to make, and I should have done this right at the beginning. I'm sorry that I forgot. Uh, under Section 2C, um, we'd like to remove, the co sponsors would like to remove, notwithstanding Sections 2A, one and to be two above and just have um, C start a person's immigration immigration status shawl that was just a whole, we left that language in from a previous iteration and it actually defeats what we're trying to say there um, with its presence so we'd just like to strike those words second the amendment great um, discussion on that amendment there are no discussion. We can do an amendment with a voice vote. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Any abstention? So that is approved. Any further amendments? We had one at the top in the beginning, did we not? Right. It's not really essential to the ordinance. It's more preamble. Um, be amended to blank. Be amended as follows. So I'd like to um, move that we strike two and just um, replace it with as follows. Very good. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay. Discussion on that amendment. All those people say aye. 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 Extensions. If I may, in section 2A, very minor. Um, so, um, unless required by state and federal law, is the intention to be or? Everywhere else, it's state or federal law, right. which would mm. seem to make sense. I'll second that. Okay. So, apparently, I made an amendment. Motion and second, uh, but I stand by it. So any discussion <laughs> on this very minor technical change? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any further discussion on this? Um, if I may, I would like to um, express my appreciation as well, um, not just to the sponsors, although I certainly have to underscore their important work on this, but to advocates and um, organizations who have worked on this, because I'm aware that this is not just something that's bubbled up in Northampton. In fact, it, it really came to us, did it not, from, from these community activists. You've seen other cities in the Commonwealth and in the Valley fight for this uh, because they know it's important. Um, I, heard, I heard many comments about sort of the moral importance of it. And it's 100% true. I mean, what's going on, I, I don't recognize our country. <laughs> I mean, some of the stuff that goes on at the, at the national level. And I'm proud when Northampton stands up against it. It makes me 
I'm proud of my home. And, and that's, that can't be emphasized enough. I think there are other considerations as well, which I'll note for the record. There's a very practical consideration. Uh, you just don't want to create what is effectively, I don't know if this is an inflammatory thing to say, but it's a, you're, you're, there are some people in this country who wish there to be basically an underclass of people who basically live in the shadows who are afraid to call the police. So for example, if you suffer, this is a very actually a, a, a very common example, if you suffer um, an incident of, dom of domestic violence, I want someone in our city to be able to call the police department and not be in fear that doing so may cause a catastrophe for her family or his family. Um, there is no benefit to carving people up like this in our society. We're, we're, we're one city, we're one community, we're one country. And when I see people going in the other direction, I just don't, under, I don't understand what could possibly be in their heart. It doesn't serve public safety to have the federal government try to weigh on a, a city like Northampton to deputize us to carry out their federal immigration and deportation plans. I also think that it's, it's not common we use the word um, we, we, we talk about what it means to, to, to be a America, frankly. We kind of, when people bring that up, I think people snicker because it sounds kind of like a cliche. It sounds kind of corny. But it's not, you know, it, it's not American to trample on the Constitution the way I've seen um, certainly this President of the United States do. I mean, we have protections against unreasonable searches and seizures. And it just, it boggles my mind why anyone could think it would ever be allowable to keep, to hold someone in custody, I don't care who they are, hold someone in custody beyond the time when they should be released. And forget the moral part of it. I mean, if that ever happened to you, you would probably turn around and sue the, the people who did it to you. <laughs> you should. And that's happened. On top of that, we, we, I heard discussion of separation of powers. I mean, the, the federal government we have is a separation, in, in a sense, between state and, 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 and federal levels of government. And it's just, unless there is a law, Councilor Dwight brought this up, he said, you know, it's amazing we have to codify this in law. We must codify it in law because unless we do, there is no policy. The Congress has passed no legitimate law that compels a local jurisdiction to, to do this. It's just, and so therefore, it's a big blank space, and it is entirely appropriate and practical and right and moral on every, on every level for our, our city to stand up and, and describe what we will do. And we ought not to just do it relying on the luck of having a, a good mayor or a good police chief. It should be codified in law. And so that's why I'm, I'm um, I'm eager to vote yes on this. I imagine it will be, it will pass <coughs> overwhelmingly here in the city council. I, I would like to ask just some questions, if I could, um, bec because of that important point that we, this is something we need to codify and not just rely on the good graces of any individual. Um, this did come to us kind of be from other places, um, and it has it has changed. <coughs> the Legislative Matters process. And I just want to understand, and I'm sure my colleagues can assuage my concern, but unlike a place like East Hampton or Greenfield, which just come out and say, a no city official shall do X. For example, detain someone beyond the time they are lawfully able to be detained, or <coughs> actively collect information about someone's immigration status, which we don't need that anyway. Um, those cities, when I read those ordinances, uh, they are very clear prohibitions on what city officials can and cannot do. Now here we have <clears throat> on section two, it is the policy of the city of Northampton that so on and so forth. And then city resources shall not be used to X, Y, and Z. So it's perhaps a subtle change. Perhaps people can convince me it's an irrelevant change. But I want to know 
why this is, this is a sufficient ordinance. And um, I understand there's a separation of powers argument to be made. So the question that I would ask <coughs> is, does this ordinance actually prohibit city officials from doing the things we want to prohibit them to? Or are they still free to do it? What does it mean to not use resources to do it? Do you understand my, my question? And so I'm there with you morally. I'm <coughs> there with you on, uh, on the practical level. I'm there with you with my vote. I just want to understand, because nor as Councilor Sheriff pointed out about Northampton's leadership role, Northampton should lead on this issue. So I want to I want to understand exactly the strength of this ordinance. And Councilor Dwight wishes to be recognized. Um, as you know, at once the establishment of the new charter, there was, as predicted, we knew, would be an ongoing struggle about the, there, there would be bright lines in some cases for the separation of powers. In some cases, there would be uh, less clear um, divisions of authority. Um, this debate plays out every time, uh, particularly when this was first discussed. Uh, does the council have the right under our charter to, and this, this actually comes up with the issue about the pesticides in the schools mm -hmm. and stuff. They, um, does the council have the authority to dictate um, the behaviors of uh, um, municipal workers? As also, and, and also the, can we direct them uh, but can we direct their actions overtly? Um, we, uh, this is the compromise we were able to, to create. Um, I would, I, I'm not going to speak for all the sponsors, but I think given our conversations, there is some frustration around this. The fact is that we, our preference would be a, a holistic, enduring, uh, very clear descriptive uh, uh, ordinance that would describe uh, and memorialize this as law. Um, in the course of our debate with the, the mayor and with the solicitor, um, the, who uh, the mayor, and he can speak for himself of course, but subscribes to all the, uh, uh, the moral directives and imperatives embedded in here, but they both express concern about the fact that this was legislative overreach. And um, rather than get hung up in that debate, it was our interest to, you know, we did not want to give up the good for the perfect in this case, and was to craft this compromise in order to get it passed in, in a timely fashion, and as particularly as we move towards our session. So I, I'm being I'm trying to be candid at the same time uh, with the proper deference. And so the, we're going to have these struggles going forward. We're going to continue to have these struggles as we try and create law and try and do it in such a way that um, the, it meets the, meets the, at least the interpreted uh, standards based on the, in the charter and versus how uh, each body interprets it. Um, it is a stressor that we knew was going to arrive. We knew when we debated the, the charter in and of itself. But um, so I'm disappointed. I share your disappointment and your concerns. Um, also, it should be said that, I mean, Councilor Barger referred to the protections that these provide. This is a minimal amount of protections. This is a baseline. Um, this is, as Javier said, this is the bare minimum, and this is the, the thing that, as, as I said, is it's kind of absurd that we even have to make it a law. But um, we can and should do better. The hope is, is that we, given the, um, the limitations of our uh, authority, that we do whatever we possibly can, and this is a start. It is not a period at the end of the sentence. It is opening up the paragraph for further discussion. Thank, thank you for the, if I may respond, I really appreciate hearing that because uh, I, I've been there, I've, I've put forward things that I've, I've had to compromise on because people were very clear that if you try to move forward with the original version, <coughs> you want to call it the purest version or the most ambitious version, you just will not succeed. 
and it, there is no progressive value. I mean, the, the purpose of, of passing a law like this is to help pe people. And if you actually don't pass a law, it doesn't help anybody. So why, I, I, I see purists all the time, and they, they really, there's, there are some people who are more interested in signaling their own virtue than actually helping those least fortunate in our society. So the three sponsors of this, um, I not only understand the political compromise, I respect it and applaud it, insofar as it was required to get something done. So please don't mistake my, oh, no. my, my comments in, in any way. Um, so I would like to say that in response. I, I, what I just want to understand is when we say we're not going to spend city resources, is this the equivalent of a prohibition on a city official doing these things? It, I mean, it seems like we're trying to say it is. I mean, is it actually a prohibition on uh, an executive branch employee doing something? I just want to know. Or is it kind of vague? Because sometimes we must leave things vague. Well, it, as you've often heard argued on, in, in this body, um, what we do preside over is the allocation of resources or the approval of the allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. So insofar as that, that apparently qualifies, that's a qualifying phrase that applies to us and our authority. Um, its vagueness worries me too. I think that a more cynical politician later could exploit that, possibly. If, if they, I, I don't see that person ever getting elected in Northampton, but it's possible. Um, I didn't think we'd have a President Trump either, so I'm, I'm, my abilities to predict are pretty poor, obviously. But the, and as you said, insofar as what we can provide, this was the best under the circumstances. It is not a coda. It's not the end. It's not the final. It's not the final approach. We're going to continue with this. Oh, thank you. And you know, I'm, and I'm really just seeking reassurance. I mean, we take it that this is an actual prohibition on this behavior. Only it's said in a way that has to do with funding and resources. I mean, is it? the expenditure of resources for a city official to c do an act, to do something? Is that an expenditure of resources? That is, so that counts, because they're being paid to do it. Okay. Okay. That, that, is, that is good to know. Thank you very much. Councilor Klein. I would like to just add for the record that I share similar concerns. I think that the um, the emphasis on separation of powers here um, did uh, have the effect of muddying the, the clarity of a policy, of a, of a piece of legislation that should be citywide policy. Um, I think it is a prohibition. I think that the mayor um, is tasked with enforcing it, in a sense, as the executive who has authority jurisdiction over employees. Um, however, I think there are ways that the charter can be interpreted differently so that the city council, I mean, I'm opining here something that is beyond this particular um, ordinance, but I think it needs to be said that there are um, ways in which the charter can be interpreted that could allow the Northampton City Council to create policy that affects what city staff can and can't do, that it doesn't have to be an executive order, that if it's a, a policy that affects, um, you know, w I could go in a, a number of directions here. I'm sorry, I'm uh, thinking faster than I can speak. Um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I think I do believe that there are ways in which uh, the interpretation of the charter is so narrow at this point that it doesn't allow us as a city council to embrace our full authority around uh, citywide policy. And that is of concern to me. And it, it definitely played out in creating this ordinance. And I think it's a, it's a shame. It's a pity. Um, but I do think that there is a clear prohibition in what we did come up with after working very hard. And I want to just add to the thanks to the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice. We have Jeff Napolitano got here late, but he really um, led us in crafting this language so that it would be acceptable. It's 
you know, Greenfield, East Hampton, Springfield all passed um, language that talked about what city staff could and couldn't do. Here in Northampton, we weren't able to do that. But thanks to Jeff and Javier and Gladys Franco, who is also here, we were able to um, come up with what is a compromise. And uh, it, it is a shame. I agree with you. Thank you. Is there any other comments? Um, let the closing comments not be that it's, it's a shame. Uh, let the closing comment be, again, me thanking Elgar, the Rep, Council Chair, Councilor Dwight, Councilor Klein, activists. I mean, I, I think that this is, in some ways, the best of legislative initiative. I hope that the new council, I see some new councilors here tonight, I hope you, I hope you take that spirit to heart. You know, don't let anyone tell you the city council shouldn't be initiating things like this. And you really need, the institution of the city council uh, does need to fight for all the authority that it has. And it is a fight, and that's natural because we, have diff we do have a separation of powers, and part of, separation of powers doesn't mean one does what the other wants. Separation of powers means there is friction, but it's creative friction. And through very skillful legislating and, and, and smart um, compromise, sounds like a bad word, but it's not actually. If you accomplish something for real people, uh, we have an ordinance which I'm, I, I'm, I'm proud to see this come forward, so I'd like to underscore my appreciation uh, for that work. Okay, so thank you very much. Any further discussion on that? It sounds like we are able to have a roll call. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Okay, that is approved in first reading. Um, now, where are we? Is everyone doing okay with, um, does anyone want to recess or anything like that? Everyone? Sure. You want to recess? Sure. You want like five minute recess? Not a, not a bad idea. I sure five minute recess. <laughs> Back in five minutes. Thank you.
under financial orders. Uh, 19162, an order to establish revolving fund for 593 Elm Street building rental. Move second reading. Made by Councilor Dwight. Seconded by Councilor Clarge. And is there any discussion on this order, please? Okay, let's have a roll call. Okay, is this a 19171? 162. 162. Did I read the wrong one? No, no, no. It's just I was. I Got to do them all sooner or later. Okay. Okay. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Klein. Yes. Okay. It was approved in the second reading. Sign there, please. Um. The tax classification, mm -hmm. and we need to get it to Susan. Uh, it needs to go that way, actually. So next is nineteen one six three, in order to purchase twenty acres for Sawmill Hills Greenway. Motion on this and second reading, please. Move approval. Move second. Okay. Made and seconded. Any discussion on this financial order? <coughs> Let's have a roll call. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. On second reading, next 19166, an order to accept donation of steel toed boots. Second. Motion to approve this bill. So moved. Moved by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Any discussion on this financial order? Hearing no discussion. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. No. <laughs> Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. That is approved in second reading. We're going to skip down to zoning. It's one zoning. Oh, go ahead. Did you want to go back to the first two, the uh, financial orders? Or yeah, I just wanted to get. Okay our senior land use planner out of here, um, if I might. And just create the most confusing agenda order I possibly could. <laughs> That's my other goal. So item 16, 16A, 19149, uh, an ordinance to rezone 37 parcels from GI to OI and portions of two parcels from GI to FFR. Motion on this ordinance, please. Move approval, please. Second. Second by Councilor Goodwell. All right, so now, um, Ms. Mish, would you like to present this? Lots of activity going on. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I believe that many of, your, many of you have seen this through legislative matters and um, the public hearing process. This is an ordinance to, it's a map change, so it would be rezoning parcels along the East Hampton Road corridor and Texas Road uh, from general industrial to office industrial for the most part. Um, these are, this follows on the heels of some changes that um, you all uh, approved in Leeds a couple of months ago, sort of along the same lines that we, that we're trying to sort of shrink the area that's general industrial and have mostly one industrial district and then a general industrial district just for the industrial park. So this would uh, accomplish sort of in a whole swath there, um, a rezoning of those. We've done a few parcels. We did actually a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, rezoned um, parcels on the west side of East Hampton Road down by um, um, the um, um, daycare <laughs> facility down on the um, southern end near the East Hampton line. Um, so this would bring um, all of those parcels and, and some of those properties in general industrial now are non-conforming for their uses. So for example, the um, self-storage um, units on the um, south side of um, Route 10 um, are not allowed in general industrial, but in office industrial they are they would be allowed, so this brings those properties into compliance. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the uses are very similar um, between the two districts. 
and would also extend, I, I think I mentioned, along Texas Road. There are two parcels that are owned by the city and are, um, have been purchased for the purposes of conservation, and those are the two parcels that are being proposed to take out of the industrial zone and into what we call farms, forests, and rivers, which are uh, um, really just identifying that they're permanently protected and they will not be developed. So that's why there are two small parcels um, there that are um, different um, from the industrial. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from the council? I'm gonna waive the reading on this because it's really just a bunch of numbers. <laughs> this is a public document. People can look it up and you can see the visual depictions with the map and other explanations as well. Any other questions from the council? Council Bidwell? Could you just provide a quick over, I, I know the differences between GA or are minimal. Can yeah. you just explain what they are? Sure, so um, I would say the general industrial district is the most intensive industrial use in the terms of in terms of truck traffic. So um, general industrial allows the large warehousing um, type of function. Um, and that's a piece that's not allowed in the office industrial, so it's sort of like the big Amazon warehousing kind of situation. We wanted to make sure that we had a space for that, and in the industrial park is the most logical place for that because it's close to the um, interchange on 91, or two interchanges accessible for to exit um, 18 and 19, um, or 19 and um, 20, sorry. Um, and then in office industrial, we actually do allow residential uses, which are not allowed in the general industrial. Um, so in office industrial, you can have residential above the first floor. Mostly it's pertinent to older mill buildings where there may be some reuse opportunities where you have ground floor um, industrial back office uses, and then, or artist live workspaces. Um, so that's allowed in office industrial. And then there's some accessory uses such as um, um, restaurant or entertainment that would be allowed in the historic mill buildings which are zoned office industrial, but we don't want to allow those in the, the sort of hardcore industrial district at, um, at the industrial park. That was the key. Thank you. Um, other questions, uh, Councilor Nash. So was there any concern uh, or comments by property owners around this change? Um, no. So we did a mailing before the zoning was introduced. Um, I don't believe, I, I may have heard back from one property owner. Um, and then we, then of course we do the official mailing for the public hearing. So those property owners got notified twice for opportunities to um, ask questions. And then at the planning board, there was no public um, comment. Oh, thank you. Please, it's Councilor Cornell. I'll just so note there also was no public comment at the legislative right. meetings last week. It was very well explained. Other comments from the council? Uh, Ms. Mish, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, it appears that we are ready to vote. This is on the floor. We have a motion on this, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, more of discussion, roll call. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that is approved in first reading unanimously. So, we will skip back up to financial orders 12, number 12, 12A. These you heard about in the Committee on Finance not long ago. Uh, 19171, in order to reprogram funds from River Road to Pine Street Bridge repair project. Move to approve, please. Second. Okay. Made and seconded. Any discussion on this financial order? Hearing none, let's have a roll call, please. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Move suspend rules, please. Your motion to suspend rules will allow for two readings. Is there a second? second. Okay. Discussion on suspension of rules. All those in favor of suspending rules say aye. Aye. Opposing aye. abstentions, rules are suspended. Is there a motion on second reading? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. second. A discussion on second reading. Hearing none, roll call. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. And Councillor Shera. Yes. 
Passed on second reading. Next is 19172, an order reprogram, $1,660 from Academy of Music LED Lights to Academy of Music Handicap Ramp Project. Move to approve. Eight and seconded. Discussion on this financial order. I hear no discussion, so let's have a roll call. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. <laughs> yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. And Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Good. Passed on first reading. Uh, now we are going to go back down to 160, I think. 160. Thank you. Uh, 19160, in order to authorize community resources committee members to cast votes as recommended by the EEC voting guide. Um, I will read this into the record, but... I'll put it on the floor. Thank you. Councilor Dwight moves approval. Second. Right, second. Second. Second by Councilor Bidwell. Um, so now... Da, 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 da. Oh, shoot. I took this out because I was looking at it out of order. So let me just click the button and pull it up on this machine. Um, so, uh, in the City Council, November 7th, uh, 2019, upon the recommendations of Councilors Elisa F. Klein and Jean Louise Shera, uh, 19160, in order to authorize Community Resource Committee members to cast votes as recommended by the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition EEC Voting Guide, whereas the Massachusetts Base Building Code follows the International, that's okay, Energy Conservation Code EIEC, a model code adopted by many states and municipal governments to establish minimum design and construction requirements for energy efficiency. Whereas by vote on September 19th, 2019, the City Council designated the four members of the Community Resources Committee as its voting representatives for the 2021 IECC. Online governmental consensus voting for the 2020 IECC opens on November 18th, 2019 and closes on December 5th, 2019. Further, the City Council voted to require CRC members to present voting recommendations for approval by the full council before casting votes in accordance with this prior authorization. Whereas in the past, various energy efficiency organizations have put forward their own voting guides, but this year, the energy efficiency community has coalesced around a single voting guide published by the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition, EECC. The recommendations of the voting guide have the potential to increase the overall residential and commercial building efficiency of the IECC by 10%. Now, therefore, be ordered that the City Council hereby approves of the recommendations relative to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, IECC, that are reflected in the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition, EECC, voting guide, and authorizes individual members of the community, the community, the community on community resources, in fact, to cast votes during online voting in accordance with the voting guide. So this is already on the floor. Um, you. I think everyone knows by now the convoluted process where, and this is the culmination of all our convoluted efforts this evening. Um, so this will allow the committee members to vote according to the voting guide. Councilor Klein. Um, I'd like to amend the order because after we um, made the recommendation in the Community Resources Committee to use the EECC guide as our voting guide, we, um, got notification that there is a mass that the Massachusetts chapter of the EECC created a Massachusetts specific guide and it has three proposals uh, that it recommends we vote yes on and because uh, we are in Massachusetts and we would like some consistency within the um, some reciprocity I guess with the, the people who are um, experts in energy efficiency in the Commonwealth, um, I'd like to suggest that we are able to use the Massachusetts specific guide as a guide as well, but specifically around three proposals. Um, I'm not quite sure how the language needs to be changed. Um, I think to make it really simple, we could say using uh, the Massachusetts specific guide as well somehow, and then really the only difference between the EECC guide, and I know this hardly makes sense <laughs> if you're not deeply involved in this, um, but there are only three proposals that are recommended by Massachusetts, and actually four, 
one of them being um, kind of a conflict with the EECC guide, but three proposals in particular in the Massachusetts specific guide that uh, are recommended that I would like us to be able to vote uh, yes on. Does that make sense to anyone? I hereby resign as council president. <laughs> My last meeting will be in December. Um, I, okay. So, let's see. First of all, thank you for all your efforts on this. <laughs> uh, the point of this order is for the council to ratify our position to allow the members to vote. So, although I'm not thrilled about changing it at the last minute, I suppose it is in order to amend it so that um, as long as it's clear what we are authorizing the members to vote on and how they are allowed to vote, I suppose it'd be in order. So I think I saw Council Bidwell first and then Council Dwight. Uh, I, I, I do uh, understand the, the distinction you're making and, and I agree that a simple amendment would be appropriate. In the, in the, uh, the final sentence of, of, the, of the order where it says that are reflected in the EECC voting guide, would it be sufficient to just say reflected in the Massachusetts specific EECC voting guide? Is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about this document that says Massachusetts top priorities? I don't know. I that's, well, that's a question for Which I uh, was handed out to I have to see what it looks like. Massachusetts. It, says, it says Massachusetts on it. Massachusetts top priorities. Did you hand that out, Laura? Yeah. Um, this is it, but I also want to switch to the, the we're going to be switching from the EECC guide to this. Oh, you're right. That's, this is the it's EECC more, voting guide. Yeah. Um, so do we do we have in front of us the EECC Massachusetts? We only specific? have samples from EECC. It's and online. Laura emailed it, didn't you? Right. Yes, and it's in the packet here too. Okay. But um, the packet's just samples. It's not the entire guide, is it? Oh, the, no, um, what you mean the packet, not not the physical. The agenda packet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It yeah. does have the entire guide there. So there are proposals in, in the EECC guide that aren't necessarily in the Massachusetts guide. So I'm suggesting that we just say both of them and then the three proposals that are in addition to what's in EECC are the ones that we would want to vote on and possibly a fourth one um, which uh, was recommended by Massachusetts specifically, but not by the EECC. Councilor Dwight was it, with it, It's to that one I, I, I want to express some concern because um, three of them, I assume, amplify already what, what is being proposed, and we're going to get lost in the IEECCCCC. <laughs> and and <laughs> but, so. For the national version, we'll call it, for lack of a better term, the Massachusetts recommendations, three of them amplify what, what their recommendations are. One is in conflict, and that's the one that concerns me, because uh, I don't know what the conflict is. I don't know, uh, you know, is, are we diminishing a recommendation by the national board, or are we actually going several steps further against their objections or something? That's what concerns me. Yes. The information I have about that is that what it's doing is the one that's in conflict is creating a net zero appendix, if it's adopted, that requires um, solar PV on unshaded roofs for buildings over 5,000 square feet based on area of largest three floors. The EECC is recommending a vote against it because it requires solar but doesn't, isn't, doesn't specify high efficiency solar whereas Massachusetts feels like it's a good baseline to be recommending. So that's the I see. speak to this. I see. Okay. So the, the Massachusetts would like, uh, would feel comfortable just even having a baseline without a, 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 a defined baseline. So yeah. whereas the IECC is not real keen on that because of, of uh, I don't know the it level doesn't of specificity. Have the granular information right. to ensure to guarantee high efficiency PV. Ms. Crutzler. Right. Um, the, I don't think you want to switch to the IECC voting no. guide. 
because this guide contains both the highest priority and the not so high. <coughs> this is only the highest priority one, so you're actually Got eliminating it. a bunch of I don't know. I understand. proposals I understand. by just. I was confused by seeing that it was Massachusetts specific, and I thought that's what we were talking about. But. Mm. Okay. So the, the, the oh, I'm concerned about this. so so the the amendment should read, but um, about Blum, I think as Councilor Bidwell pointed out, um, are that are reflected in the uh, Energy Efficient Codes Coalition EEC voting guide, <coughs> and add to that in the Massachusetts. Um, specific EEC. Do you want to comment on that? I have a suggestion as well. I think you could just add the three um, Massachusetts state um, That's right. specific proposals that are unique That's right. to the IECC. Exactly. Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. And if you did that, that would yeah. have all right. of these and capture the three that you're missing. Good. So do we have a, a, a series of letters and numbers? <laughs> so it looks I like it's written in assembly code or something. <laughs> And um, what I assume we can do is just add those additional specifically say the international code, whatever it is, and then these three and list them so that there is no conflict. Because otherwise, if we say X and Y, except where there are conflicts, et cetera, et cetera, just say the, nat the national one and C, whatever. CE 53, CE 264, and RE 50 are the three that we would like added from the Massachusetts specific guide. Very good. Step one, we're going to write the actual amendment on the fly. So uh, um, after you do this. Can, and, can you repeat that? The and then. RE 50, I got that one. Let's where are we in the. CE 53, CE 264, and RE 50. Okay, now where where does that go? <coughs> this is, I just want to know exactly where it goes. I want to pull up the order, if we might. And we'll just so it's the last, answer. therefore be it ordered. It says that are reflected in the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition EECC voting guide. And as well as and those three numbers, those three proposals from the Massachusetts specific guide and authorizes individuals. So you're just adding and okay. those three from the Massachusetts specific guide. Okay. To read, uh, some some something that are reflected in the Energy Efficient Codes Coalition EECC voting guide as well as proposals. And then we list the ID numbers. Okay. Um, CE 53, CE 264, RE 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. As they appear in the, what is it? The Massachusetts specific guide, which is the okay. EECC Massachusetts Good. specific guide. Extremely specific. Okay. Everyone understand the amendment? Yeah. Who seconds the amendment? I do. Second. Now, did we already explain exactly what these things are? Just extremely quickly, what are C, What are these ID numbers? CE 53 is a modest requirement for solar PV based on area of largest three floors. One of the EECC partners submitted a public comment in support of this. Um, so we know that EECC is actually also somewhat in support of it. CE 264 is commercial net zero appendix um, that the American Institute of Architects has as its highest priority proposal. Um, <coughs> EECC did not include it on their list because based on a public comment they submitted, they didn't feel the way the proposal was written was quite ready for prime time. But they didn't recommend to vote against it either. So that's another one that's in the Massachusetts specific, but the EECC did not choose to recommend it. I mean, all of these are, but there's a little explanation as to why on that one. RE50 facilitates wood construction for structural walls, allows for wood timbers to be counted as thermal mass without needing to do a study each time they are used. So that's more information that we have that, that these, now we have all this information on these that we don't have on the other, we haven't voiced on all of the other 200 some odd proposals from the EECC mm -hmm. guide. But that's the specifics of those three. So the, the national guide plus these three specifics which we have enumerated and now explained are what the four members, should this order pass, are authorized to vote for. 
Any questions on this? Um, okay, any other discussion? Um, that sounds like a decent solution to me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so um, this is. Let's just have a roll call, please. Did that? You know what? I don't have it that we did. So I don't you know if I just thank you. Her. Thank you very much. Um, right. So. Who made the motion to actually amend this? I Councilor Klein, did. second by Councilor Dwight, as I recall. Sure. That's right. Yes, okay. I did. So you did that. Okay. So any discussion on the amendment? Okay. Hearing none. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. The <coughs> final call for comments on the order itself as amended. Uh, hearing none. Now we can have a roll call. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Suspend the rule. <coughs> Suspend rules will have two readings. We'll hear a second to that. Second. Second. Discussion suspension of rules. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those same abstentions. Rules are suspended. There's motion on second reading. I so moved. Second. We, ap we are absolutely sure we have these numbers correct? Yes. 100%? Okay. Uh, then let's have a roll call, please. Okay. Um, Councillor Klein? Yes. <coughs> Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. And Councillor Dwight? Yes. Passed in the second reading. Thank you. Happy voting, everybody. <laughs> Fun clicking the mouse 400 <laughs> times. <or whatever. laughs> it's only 200. Oh, it's 200? 203 now. 800 altogether. 203, is that what it is? <laughs> Click wrong. Yeah, really. <laughs> and we all go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be violating You'll our be order. Violating <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. The constable will come right. get us. That's right. All righty, good. So now, 19 ones. This is the controversial one right here. <laughs> 19170, an order exempting the city of Northampton from appointing weighers of hay, weighers of coal, and fence viewers <laughs> of all things. I, uh, all my years. <laughs> I have never seen such a bold. This is what I'm going to miss. No, I, this is. <laughs> right. So I, I feel really approval. close to everyone here when well, we tackle stuff. Second, question, how long after serving the city council can one still be employed as a fence viewer? Uh -huh. Not after this ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Right. Because <laughs> it's not, you don't get redeemed anyway. So I, I move the approval on this. Move approval. And there's, there's I a, seconded it. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you would like to present this? Well, it's just as I was going through uh, making some changes to our administrative order, um, the administrative code, rather, we're still required uh, to maintain these three positions under state law. And of course, we don't really have anybody who weighs hay or coal, and we don't have fence viewers anymore. Um, so I did some research as to how we could because actually the city clerk said, yeah, are you going to appoint anybody? We used to appoint the Willard family right. because they had the commercial scale out of the um, gravel pit, but there's no longer that anymore. So even that fiction has kind of gone away. So um, because one of these was a special, act, was a local acceptance act that was actually accepted on December 11th, 1888, um, it'll take an act of the legislature to kind of unaccept that. And then it'll also take an act of the legislature to exempt us from having to appoint the other two. So um, basically I'm asking you to authorize me to file this special act um, and I'll then ask our legislators to file it and we'll see whether or not the great and general court will um, relieve us of this, uh, of this burden. So and then we can remove it from our codes and mm -hmm. um, Pam Powers won't have to ask me every year who I'm appointing or whoever the city clerk is. Council Chair. Um, did you ask John Fry if he wanted to add this to his CV? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we do have somebody who actually professionally goes out and checks all of the scales to make sure they're okay. Yeah. But not the hay. Not the hay. Well, I guess you could weigh hay, but the scale would have been inspected by our sealer of weights and measures. So. It's John's signature on all <laughs> exactly. on every scale of hay. It's the scale, not the hay, but <laughs> it's checked That's all the scales right. in The hay scale, right. Yeah. So, Councilor Joy. The, my very first question as a city council when I first got sworn in was, what the hell is this? I don't, because I honestly didn't know. I didn't know what a fence viewer was. It sounded like a good job and I would love to sign up for something like that. 
just sit down and stare at a fence for eight hours a day. But it's true. And then uh, also have his own enforcement officers who can right. make sure that fences are where they're supposed That's to be. That's exactly what it was. It was, it was explained to me uh, patiently with some eye rolling with <laughs> what these okay. important jobs were. And the, and the point, in fact, that Willard's was uh -huh. because they had a large scale then I asked, when was the last time they weighed coal or hay? And they said that they, they never had exactly. ever weighed hay or coal. I'm not sure why they'd be required to weigh hay, but in a way that was even an <laughs> issue. But apparently in 1888, it was a higher value commodity at the time. So yeah, I mean, we, we the Massachusetts is filled with all sorts of things like this. I remember the last controversial thing that we did relative to this is when we eliminated the town crier. The town crier, yes. Um, because the last town crier we had was arrested for being a pederast, but and but the only possessor of the tricorner hat and <laughs> knickers and and we, it's quaint. These are quaint <coughs> anomalies, but I, I think it's worth yeah. getting. Up the, I, I think it's worth getting rid of these uh, anachronistic tales, as it were. <clears throat> I think we should reappoint the fence viewer to be the political sign viewer oh, okay. because right. there's, you know, a lot of controversy. Yeah. There's no such motion as call the question, but I'm going to invoke it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other discussion on this that desperately needs to be said? Because um, I still have to read this puppy for the record, so I'm going to do that as quickly <laughs> as possible. <clears throat> 19170, an order exempting the city of Northampton from appointing weighers of hay, weighers of coal. Uh, and fence viewers ordered that the mayor is hereby authorized and request to petition the general court to the end that the following legislation be adopted precisely as follows. The general court may make clerical or editorial changes of form only to the bill unless the mayor approves amendments to the bill before enactment by the general court. The mayor is hereby authorized to approve amendments which shall be within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition. Entitled an act exempting the city of Northampton from appointing wares of hay, wares of coal, and fence viewers. Whereas the deferred operation of this act would tend to defeat its purpose, which is to forthwith relieve the city of Northampton from appointing wares of hay, wares of coal, and fence viewers. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives in, the, in general court assembled and by the uh, authority of the same as follows. Section one, notwithstanding section one of chapter 49 of, gen of the general laws, the mayor of the city of Northampton shall not be obligated thereby to appoint fence viewers and said section one shall not be applicable to the city of Northampton. Section two, the city of Northampton is authorized <coughs> to rescind the vote to accept the provisions of section 236 of chapter nine <coughs> four of the general laws taken <coughs> by the Northampton Board of Aldermen on December 11th, 1888 by vote of the city council and approval of <coughs> section three. Notwithstanding section 238 of chapter 94 of the general laws, the mayor of the city of Northampton shall not be obligated thereby to appoint wares of coal <coughs> and said section 238 shall not be applicable to the city of Northampton. <coughs> uh, this is already on the floor. <coughs> is that correct, the motion? No further discussion, I don't think. All right, hearing no further discussion, <coughs> uh, we can have a roll call on this. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. <coughs> Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Yeah. First reading is a historic it's day. Next is 19177, order to execute standard contract agreement for auditing uh, uh, fiscal year F, uh, FY16, FY18. Um, I'm going to pull this. We're going to put, <coughs> put this on the next agenda. This needs a little bit of TLC. It's just a technical thing. We've already awarded the contract to Scanlon. This is about signing the contract. So December, first meeting of December, we're going to do that. We have plenty of time. Um, so now, uh, two ordinances. A any objection to doing that? No. no. Uh, <coughs> two ordinances is not yet referred. Like um, the move to refer them both? Sorry. To legislative matters. 173 and 176 to uh, legislative matters. Okay. Uh, and one's the zoning ordinance. Yes. Right. And the planning. Uh, this is uh, 19173, an ordinance to allow changes from one conforming use to another without a finding. And 19176, an ordinance prohibiting the use of face surveillance. System. So Council Drive moves both as a group to legislative matters. Is there a second on that? Second. Second. Any discussion on the referral? <coughs> All those in favor of the referral say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Do either of them go anywhere else? No? Well, the zoning one goes to the planning right. board, but. Reviewed by the mayor. Do we need to refer to the planning board? This is going to take it up, aren't they? Thing. Well, move, motion to send this to the planning board. Sure. So moved. Okay. 
Second. Or second on that. Second. second by Councilor Dwight uh, and Nash. Uh, any discussion on the referral? Uh, all those in favor of referral say aye. 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 Those same abstentions. All right, they are off. We've done 16. Now we have ordinances to actually do. We've done uh, 19136. That was, oh no, is that? No, 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 we have not done that. All right, so now 19136, an ordinance to amend chapter 312, vehicles and traffic to amend definition of parking meters <coughs> violation. First reading, motion on this please for approval. So moved. Second. Okay, Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Shera. Uh, discussion? I defer to, oh, Councilor Dwight. Uh, just simply, this is to uh, update our, the fact that we have uh, different equipment with different modalities of paying, and this is to, to create uh, the, the pay-by-play technology and the uh, app, and to embed that in law. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? <coughs> this went to the Transportation Parking Commission. Um, yes. Good. Positive recommendation. Positive recommendation. Um, is there a desire for me to read the changes? Or the the okay. Yeah, wave reading, yeah. Wave the reading. Again, it's public it's document, if you want to access it, you may. <coughs> uh, but basically, um, it there, was, there was a minor amendment in legislative matters, which oh. is uh, to uh, change the term app to application. Uh, or because oh, right. if we're going to make a law, we should actually use the full word. Right. Yeah. But you didn't put any memes into it. No it, memes. So no. <laughs> no cats. No cats. No. <laughs> All right. So it's, it's on the floor. Uh, we understand what the ordinance does. Any further discussion? <coughs> uh, roll call, please. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Klein. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. All right, that was approved in first reading. Next, 19155, an ordinance. So you're skipping some now. Mm -hmm. This is uh, an ordinance to delete reference to the depot lot from section 312.110. Move approval, please. Second. Second. Thank you. Made and seconded. Um, discussion on this or explanations? Uh, Councilor Dwight. The explanation is simply the, this is removing from law the designation of the depot lot which does not exist. So we are right. we are just cleaning up the law and in so doing um, getting rid of what's now an imaginary parking lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other discussion on this ordinance? Okay. So <coughs> let's have a roll call please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Approved on first reading brings us to 19156, an ordinance relative to parking on Phillips Place. Motion to approve this, please. So moved. Made. Made and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Discussion. This one bears some explanation. I defer to uh, Councilor Nash. He's the one who <coughs> presented it so eloquently to us. <laughs> Councilor from Ward Clark, could right. we have the <laughs> picture of the truck, please? <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? Of the one? There's a there's a photo. There's a lovely picture of a truck. It's very impactful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's I've seen this. Good picture. There we go. <laughs> Uh, so this is a truck on our truck escape route, <laughs> heading up, up Phillips Place and turning left onto Pomeroy Terrace. And that, as you can see, it's well out of the travel lanes and it's starting to brush up against the utility pole mm -hmm. there. And um, as Fred Zimnock has come in and shown us pictures before that of the bruising that that utility pole has uh, put up with over the years. Um, the, um, the reason this is occurring is, the, we think it's occurring, is has to do with that you can't see on here uh, that, um, but cars are allowed to park <coughs> on the right-hand side of, of uh, Phillips Place there, pretty near to the corner. And what happens is the truck can't fully get into the right lane before it has to turn left. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how to, if there's a, 
it can't make the swing. It, you have to do the a free swing, turn to make right. the swing into the next land. And so, um, and so what happens is the, 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 to make that turn, the truck needs to go up on the curb there or uh, bump, <coughs> bump up against the utility pole. So this would increase the no parking zone. Mm -hmm. It would um, uh, take away approximately two to three spaces. The, the, these are not marked uh, striped parking spaces, so it's, you know, how ma however many cars you can fit in there. Um, but approximately two to three spaces. Uh, s uh, there's been um, <coughs> some concern by constituents on Phillips Place that they don't want to lose parking, and I completely understand that. Uh, but I've also heard from a lot of people that, uh, in the neighborhood this is really necessary. So that's my eloquent explanation. Mm -hmm. It's good. Uh, any questions? Okay, uh, so ready for roll call on this? Roll call. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor <coughs> Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that was approved on first reading. Next is another hashtag third ward problem. <laughs> uh, 19. <laughs> 157, an ordinance relative to parking on Walnut Street. First reading. Motion on this, please. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, so, Councilor Nash, shall we defer to you again? Sure. Thank you. So, um, on Walnut Street, there are two driveways that are approximately, I'd say, about 9 to 10 feet apart. And that uh, within that 9 to 10 feet, uh, uh, some of the neighbors have started parking their cars. We, the requirement for a parking space in the city is about 20 feet. And so what's happening is that people are parking, trying to park in this space, which uh, doesn't fit. Um, it, you can't park within three feet of a driveway as, as it is. So y you would need like a seven foot car. <laughs> and um, so anyway, the cars are parking illegally here and they're actually blocking either one of the driveways. And so uh, the police are getting called at uh, all hours. In particular, there's a gentleman who works uh, over at uh, Williston at night and he shows up at around midnight and s sometimes finds he can't get in his driveway because a car has blocked off access and he's calling our police department. Mm -hmm. The police have been out there and it, sometimes they will enforce and ticket and other times they're, they're saying, well, there's no park, you know, there's, it doesn't identify this as a no parking zone. So the idea is that we will be identi identifying that area as a no <coughs> parking zone uh, so that uh, we can put a sign up telling people not to park there. Questions? Discussion on that? Mm -hmm. uh, pretty common problem, I still in Day Avenue. I mean, all those streets are, I mean, I don't want to take parking away, but it seems like it's not a parking space for people. <coughs> I think probably you're still going to have people continue to park. <laughs> but, but, well, it, it, with some signage, it will probably yeah. deter a lot of people. And um, yeah. Definitely. Any other discussion? All right, hearing none, we're ready for a roll call. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. So that is approved in first reading. Can we get a second reading on that? Uh, uh, Councillor uh, Nash uh, move, moves. Move second. Suspend yes. rules. Yep. And, uh, second. second. Okay. So council. Yep. Yeah, it's been moved. Uh, discussion and suspension of rules. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Klein. I guess I'd just like to hear why. Oh, it did. The sign's already there. This is. No, then. This has been going on for quite a while. That, uh, you know, that first the complaints went to the police department uh, and, and then the DPW. And then I got involved. Councilor Labarge has also been involved as. She knows many people in 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 the in the city as well, and so um, yeah, th th this discussion's been going on since like September. So, cool. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, any 
any other discussion? Suspension of rules. All those in favor of suspending rules say aye. 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 I'm opposed. I'm opposed. Uh, no offense. Uh, any abstentions? Is that the only opposed? Uh, uh, you got two? Two opposed. Two opposed. Uh, um, move second reading. Second on that from? Second. Councilor Bidwell. Any discussion on second reading? <coughs> I, full, I, I fully support your effort. Uh, so let's have a roll call. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. No. Councillor Shara. <laughs> I mean, I support the, I just didn't think we needed to do two readings. Uh, yes. Per perfectly consistent position as far yes. as I'm no, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, any new business oh, that passed on first, re uh, second reading? Any new business this evening? Do we have item 164? One 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 oh, God, do we? Yep. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> Eliminating revolving funds for the senior gift shop. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing that doesn't exist. Draconian measure. <laughs> That's right. right. Uh, and you can no longer buy raw coal or hay there. <laughs> So 16, one, six, excuse me, geez, 19, one, six, four, an ordinance to amend chapter 16, departmental revolving funds to delete senior services gift shop revolving fund. Move approval, please. Thank Second. you. Thank you. Any discussion on this? What is it? Just I, I, This is, for some reason, I lost it. Uh, is it up on the screen? Yeah. Oh, would you like to explain? Can you just explain it? Yeah, thanks. We had a discussion about it during the budget. Actually, Council of Barge raised it during the budget. Uh -huh. Now, thanks to the wonders of the, moder of the Municipal Modernization Act, uh, not to be only have order. to do an order for a revolving fund, but we actually have to put it in the ordinance book, yeah. um, and which I don't really think is a modernization. But anyway, uh -huh. so we have to now remove it from the ordinance book, even though it's been defunded from the um, senior center. We actually have to now remove it from the list that's in the ordinances as well. So, thank you. Is is I mean is it any is it controversial in, in any way? Um, I mean, like we approved the budget yes, summer, and now it's the end of the year. We just we just got around to doing it because yes, it's just kind of a and weird thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I think the finance director at the time of the budget said she'd be coming back with an ordinance uh -huh, to then uh -huh. do part two, which is just removing it. So so it's just not needed. I guess. It's not needed. Okay. Yeah. It's going where the depot lot went. There's other <laughs> and There's hay other and coal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Helpful for the public as well. Uh, so, any discussion on this? We have the motion on the floor, do we? Yes. Thank you. Roll call. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Okay. <coughs> oh, any information requests? Any new business? Hearing adjourn, please. Second unadjourned. Second. Any opposed adjournments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night. Amen. Thank you. What?